Like I'd start painting something, I'd, I, it wouldn't be the neatest work. You'd open social media, you'd look at what they've done and you'd want to throw yours in the bin. And that's basically why I just sort of stopped. How can people sort of stay motivated? Not everyone has to enjoy every single aspect. It actually then helps the motivation to go and paint. I think that's been my one of my biggest struggles over the last two or three years. That's what I'm trying to realise now. So I was just outside and <laughs> walking to the building and Mr. Liam Dempsey's there. Like, I was, yeah. How are you? You well. Little sign. Let me in. Let me in, yeah. yeah. Yeah, no. Well, I thought I thought we had a really good chat when I popped down to your amazing new studio. And yeah. um, and I thought it'd be like the perfect thing to do to invite you up and come on to a painting podcast, which is a thing that you were feeling a little bit outside your comfort zone about returning to doing and chuck yeah. you in the deep end and get you talking about painting again. So, yeah, my um, a lot of my uh, channel members have been quite frankly, ripping me for coming on a painting podcast. Like, <laughs> what does Liam know about painting? He's never painted anything in his life. No, it happened years ago. There was a time. In fairness, we've been saying the same thing about Joe. Before. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. let's not bring well, up... Put it this not... way, I had one week where I wasn't here. We got Paul from packing on and everyone seemed to value what he had to I'll, say more than I'll, me. I was just going to bring up Paul <laughs> so... and say that he had a home run episode. Yeah. Um, but yeah, no, um, I thought it'd be really good because um, yeah, obviously, look, you mentioned that you painted quite a lot bit previously and you obviously you had the desire to get back into it. Um, and we're all about having different types of guests on here talking about their experience with painting. Cause I think we have all different types of people that watch the show that it's always good to hear other people's perspectives on, yeah. on their approach to painting or how they got into it and all those kind of things. And I just think that it'd be, it was great to get you on. Basically. I think it's silly to say as well, that just because you're not a professional painter, you don't have any good advice to give. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Like, yeah. I mean, we had, uh, we had Paul on the episode and Paul uh, like only paints a little bit as a hobby and he dropped the, the hobby hack the of the sp sprue. Sprue bomb. Uh, so yeah. You're yeah. Picking up Paul again. Like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. you, you know to, what? You went well. to your annual review, Joe. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You yeah, didn't bring up the sprue. Like, um, yeah. but, yeah. I, uh, we had, there's, there's a couple of things I'd love to say against that actually is that we had, Dave from Any Wargaming on, who I know you're, you're friends with as well. Yeah, yeah. And he had a really good point of that, like, actually most people don't really want to hear from, like, professionals. They want to hear from people that they can relate, relate to. to a bit a hard little to hear that more. on the show. But yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's what I mean. Like, the, the instant thought is like, oh, I don't know what I'm talking about. I don't, I'm not a professional. I don't want to do it. But, like, actually more people might gravitate towards that. Yeah. We was like, and, yeah, you're right, Dave. Let's pack up. <laughs> we'll call it in. And <laughs> also... Um, in terms of like passing on knowledge and things like that, I've actually regurgitated something on this podcast that I got from you before. Oh, I'm now I'm nervous. Yeah, <laughs> right. which is, um, I don't know if this was in person, if we were talking about this in person or if I was watching a stream or something, but I remember you talking about particularly enjoying building and cleaning yeah. models at some point. And that kind of, you were the first person I'd ever heard actually talk about enjoying it. So I was like, Oh, maybe that is an enjoyable thing. And we spoke a little while ago about um, how looking at building and cleaning has its own thing. Mm -hmm. yeah, maybe yeah. if you're not in the mood for painting, you can you can sit down and build and clean. I and building and cleaning for me is incredibly therapeutic. And mm. the thing is, at the point in which you finish the build and the clean, that model still has the potential to look really nice. Yeah. When I start the paint, that, that potential goes away. <laughs> yeah. That's the problem. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, we, we've spoke about it on, on different episodes before where like, there's so many different aspects to the hobby and um, and like painting is obviously one of them. Gaming is obviously one of them. But that part is it, is often overlooked. Like it's a massively important part of the process. And at the same time, it's not really spoken about that it's it's quite an integral part. I think it's spoken about very little, but it's thought by a lot of people. And I think because a lot of people don't say it, a lot of people don't sort of... Potentially, they're, yeah. They're a silent uh, majority. Uh, if you know I, mean. I mean, the irony is as well, You've built custom service, yeah, which is predominantly around the building and converting. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right, it's clearly a huge part of the hobby. Yeah, you've built yeah. a whole no, separate right, business actually. about it. Yeah, no, you're 100 percent right. Yeah, I yeah. never thought, never thought of that actually. Um, but just to do uh, our due diligence for anyone who's uh, listened to the show who is not familiar with you, Liam, do you want to give just a background on uh, what the channel is? And no. <laughs> 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 yeah. So uh, I mean, I, had, I was asked this channel recently on uh, this question recently on on Peachy's channel when he was on. Um, painting phase and it's really hard to kind of shoehorn it into a market because we kind of do a bit of everything um, so predominantly the, the channel started with talking heads pre-recorded content it then moved into pre-recorded battle report content and now we do both those things but just live instead uh, we recently moved into a new studio space so i'm starting to reintroduce the pre-recorded aspects uh, hence we had you on as our first guest for the talk show yeah, yeah. Uh, but predominantly we stream at the moment we stream five times a week minimum and it's a combination of talk shows and and, and game shows 
I don't like to call them battle reports because we typically don't really report on the battle. I mean, a lot of times I think people could have no idea what's going on, on the tabletop. Um, <laughs> part is the uh, reporting of the battle. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> we don't really do that part. Shut that right out the window. Like, yeah. we, could, we, we, we could honestly, we could have chess pieces at the table that I think people wouldn't care because it's more about, for me personally, at least we try and showcase kind of two people having fun playing the game and enjoying themselves and that kind of camaraderie and, and like banter that exists between the two people. I think of that like how Top Gear is a car show, we, but so you're not there for the cars really. Literally talked about this on the, on the stream the other night as well. That's exactly the angle I went for with it because I watched him and that show for ages and I was like, it got to the point where I was like, oh yeah, there's cars. That's yeah. the thing <laughs> on the show, there's cars. Um, but I started like, I followed them when they went to Amazon and did Grand Tour and I was like, the reason for that is because I followed the personality and yeah. the individual. Yeah. And the entertainment value rather than the specific topic he was covering. So we then, I found myself recently with my wife watching Clarkson's farm. And I never thought in a million years I'd sit watching a show on a farm. <laughs> but because it's Clarkson and he, he brings that same kind of energy and entertainment, 100% I kept watching it. And we've, we've kind of tried to implement the same thing on the channel. So that's what we do. We, we literally just mess around, ha enjoy ourselves, have fun. And thankfully, it seems that the audience are enjoying it too, at the moment at least, touch wood. Yeah. I, I, love, I love the term that you put to it, this garage hammer. I, yeah, I, yeah. I, I love it. I think it's just such, great. such a great term for yeah. it. It's like you can just, it's exactly what you, you, know, you grow up with, you, you know, um, that, that, that sort of like environment where you're playing with your mates, playing the game in, in, in literally the garage or yep. conservatory or whatever. Um, but yeah, like that, that way it definitely comes across in the videos as quite natural, which I think is really good. Well, we also, it helps that the games themselves for the streaming at least started in the garage. It's literally, we're literally doing it in a one car garage in the UK, which if you're not watching from the UK, they're not big buildings. <laughs> no, not. <laughs> uh, no. So we were, we were cramped to this, there's three of us cramped to this garage and it was, I mean, we were playing in there before we started streaming and they were like, we, we put some cameras on and we could turn this into content. Um, but garage hammer is exactly the vibe. Like if you want. If you want competitive and, and that kind of angle, then you go to your Vanguard Tactics and your Art of Wars. If you want fully narrative, you can go to your Lutins. We just don't sit in either of those spaces. No, no, I was exactly. like, I'm not a hyper narrative person. I'm never going to be a hyper competitive person. I just kind of sit in this middle space. And the theory was that I think it's probably one of the biggest spaces out of all the three spaces. And that's kind of the, the audience we try and appeal to at least. I think it's very relative to a lot of people because yeah. like, they, they, like the exact thing you said, like, you know, that you can watch it and feel like, like, you're part of it in mm -hmm. that way. Um, whereas obviously maybe maybe more on the tactical side, you, you know, people focus obviously on specific things that units are doing and the, the way, the actual reporting of the game and the way that it plays. Yeah. Um, whereas they're watching it for you and for how you enjoy what, what it is that you're doing, which I think is great. Um, it's nice as well that you've managed to do it with like nice production value, but it still feels... Yeah, oh, lo-fi. If you get what I mean. Yeah, that's just a snob in me. <laughs> like that. Was bring. that was that potentially a little bit of a worry on moving to like a higher end studio space what, like, losing the coming com coming away from the garage yeah 100 uh, and there was people there's audience members of ours who were regular watchers who had expressed genuine concern about it before we even went live and i was mm. like have i made a terrible decision here <laughs> taking on thousands of pounds of professional space has this been a terrible decision um thankfully the feedback we've had since we've been in there we've been in there now for four months is that we've not lost any of the vibe of anything <laughs> there is a like so the garage was in my house. It's literally built into the house, right? So it would get to 10 o'clock at night and something would happen and you'd want to scream and shout, I've got two kids asleep upstairs <laughs> and I know what's going to happen and I know she's going to be at the door like, upset <laughs> <laughs> like the wife. Um, so that, that's allowed, like we've been allowed, I guess, to be a little bit more expressive as well. We can be a bit louder, a bit more obnoxious, a bit more top gear um, <laughs> because we're in that space and there's yeah. no one else around. So I think actually it's arguably it's helped a little bit, mm. but we were definitely concerned that we'd lose that vibe. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. Again, it's another thing we kind of brought up with Dave was that like they've kind of kept their their vibe and yeah. feel over the years. And they were obviously around early, early YouTube, which is a, a, a vibe that you can't really capture now at no, all. Yeah. Like, yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. Uh, so in terms of getting started then, you said you were just sort of playing games in the garage anyway. Is that, are you already doing other YouTube stuff at that point? Or yeah, you... so... You... So the channel, interestingly, the channel officially launched back in 2017 or 18. It was a long time ago. And it started because um, we had our second child. And Luce and I, what we decided to do the second time around, was we basically split the night into shifts, right? So we both got some sleep. So I would do, uh, we'd, he'd be fed at 11. And I would do 11 till, no, he'd be fed at 1. And I'd, do, I'd stay up until 1 o'clock. I'd feed him at 1 o'clock. I'd put him to bed. I'd go to bed. He'd wake up again at 5. And Luce would get up at 5. But she'd been in bed from like, nine o'clock mm. so she did a decent night's sleep she'd get up feed him at five i stay in bed because i don't like early mornings <laughs> and it got to a point where i sit there at 
she'd go to bed at she'd go to bed at nine because she's shattered they've got a newborn baby and i'd sit there and i'd be like i don't really have I don't know what i'm gonna do now and i've watched all this the tv series i want to watch and i could paint some models but we'll talk about this later i'm great at procrastinating that <laughs> so, I, so i grabbed the camera and just started filming myself sat in a chair talking about warhammer and it was there was no intent there it was just this could be something fun to learn um I, like i didn't think uh, we spoke about this on the podcast before. I didn't think I'd grow a channel. I didn't think I'd have an audience. I never thought I'd monetize it. This could just be fun. Maybe people care. And it turned out people seemed to care. And that's mm-hmm. how it started. Uh, all of it was pre-recorded, and all of it was dreadful in the early days as well. And the production value was so bad back then. <laughs> so I actually, I got back into Warhammer in about 2017. Yeah. And I remember finding your channel. Uh, Don't lie. OG but, listener. But I'm being, but before it was your name. Look, if, Before the, pack, if the packing man is taking your job, I'm, I, don't, I, don't, I, don't have space. I remember finding I remember finding your channel because as a bit of a YouTube nerd, I always whenever I'm getting into something, I like to find the smaller channels. Yeah, for whatever reason. So I always used to um, little tip for everyone: you can find some cool stuff like this. I always filter uh, if I'm looking at something, and then I filter by like upload date. And you find stuff that's been uploaded like 10 minutes ago by some channel with 10 subscribers. And sometimes it can be some really cool stuff. And uh, so I did that with Warhammer when I was getting back into it. And uh, I found I found your channel fairly early on, oh, um, no. which, I, which I remember, yeah. Um, so, I, yeah, I mean, because I, I kind of remember, not that I was like a, a, a diehard viewer or anything, but I was definitely mostly like your stuff and mini wargaming that I was kind of looking at most. And I remember you kind of, Dipping in and out of over the years, like amounts of content, if that makes sense, or like having a little break coming back. Yeah. So, um, yeah, really cool to see where it's at now. Yeah. Well, yeah. so again, early days, there was there was zero commitment to it. So it was like if I yeah. upload a video and they don't upload one for three weeks, who cares? Yeah, yeah. Uh, then, as a lot of people are aware, I, for a while I partnered up with Winters and we built a business. Um, and I put all of my time and energy into building that business. So I, I had everyone's got finite time, uh, and I had a full time job at the time as well. So I couldn't put, I couldn't make my own content, run that business and do my job. So something had to go. Mm. My job paid my my bills and DZ was starting to pay some money and YouTube was doing zero. So that was the thing that went for the longest time. It's the easy mm. choice. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. Um, and it only, it got to a point where I, 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 I'll be honest with you, it got to a point where I felt like I'd lost a bit of identity and that's part of the reason why I, I launched the channel again. Mm. Uh, and I, I experiment with different things. I did some content that wasn't Warhammer based and, and I just sort I of played around. Like tech. Yeah, it was, yeah, that was stuff. also terrible, right? <laughs> My channel was like a history of what not to do <laughs> until <laughs> until a certain point. And then well, um, we have a clip now. Yeah. <laughs> <to me> too. <laughs> and then through through lockdown, lockdown I, I think saw a real like surge in people watching content because you couldn't go and play the game. Yeah. So you had to watch it. And I and I watched content. And the people that I found that kind of inspired where the channel is now were people like Valrak and people like Tabletop Titans. Um live stream games, live stream talking heads stuff. Sam stuff, well, no matter what you think about the guy and his leaking, his content's great, it's entertaining, it's funny. And again, it's got that kind of Top Gear vibe, like you, you're you entertained by the personality rather than the content. Mm-hmm. Um, so he's why I started doing talking heads to start with. And I was watching what Titans were doing and thinking like, I'm never gonna be able to do that at all. But then I got to know Boxy up at Vanguard Tactics, who's an hour away from me. And he was like, hey, do you wanna come and hang out? And I'll show you, like, I, I do the same sort of thing. And I came and learned how to live stream games. I was like, actually, I probably could do this, even in the space I've got. And that's why, like, because of, because of what Boxy showed me, because what Titans do, because what Varag does, that's why the content is what it is now, basically. Yeah, I always like to give credit to the people that I kind of copied, you know, because <laughs> yeah, I, I think it's fair. Like, yeah, no, 100%. That's why I do it. I'm going to give them a shout out. And if you've not seen those channels, you should check them out because that's why yeah. I do what I do now. Yeah. It's really interesting because, like, you're, I remember, like, your, your new, your, when I first walked into your new set, and I've got to, we've got to talk about it because I know we've spoken, said you've moved in there, it's four months ago, but you're, I, I, for, for for those of for those of you that have not seen anything of the new set, the presentation is like amazing. You literally feel like you've gone to Scandinavia on like a holiday, <laughs> like, um, like um, but but yeah, like that that's that's a really really awesome space, and I think that it's going to give you the ability to do so much more over the next couple of years, and like with all the growth and things that you want to do with the channel, um, and the other things obviously that you've got in the works. But like, but what 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 for me, I think it, it just shows the really nice commitment to doing stuff the best that you physically can in that yeah. presentation of how you've done it. It's a real challenge to, to put together what I think is incredibly high production value mm-hmm. whilst maintaining the garage hammer vibe. Yeah, and yeah. that was really important to us. And touch wood, I think we've got it. 
I think because it feels very homely. Like you go in there and it does feel like you know, it doesn't feel cold. Like and you've got all the wood and wax. Oh, just it, imagine James being impressed that the heating was on. It, doesn't feel it was quite warm actually. Cold. To be fair, it, it, it was quite warm. He's yeah. a petite man. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I think the reason that when shows like get that higher production value and it like shifts, I don't think it's because it's like nicer cameras. I think it's because people feel like they kind of present differently. Do you know yeah. what I mean? Like, oh, I've got these fancy cameras and these nice lights. I mean, I think people act differently. But I don't so, think- so Joe, who, my Joe, who's my, my sort of second, he's the guy who, who works for me. Um, he's adorable. He's lovely. He's a fan favorite. But he's a blithering idiot. Um, <laughs> and I mean this in the nicest possible way, right? But so when he, when he if, if, they, if they're doing a stream, if they're doing a show and I'm not playing, he does the intro and he does a terrible job. And he just kind of bumbles all over the place. And what you end up having to do when you're producing is you end up having to press buttons to prompt him. So one of the buttons, one of the buttons you press, and it brings up the little classical YouTube, click the like, click the subscribe. And he'll start rambling. The streams, and he's just chatting nonsense. And you're like, well, it's been 10 minutes, Jay. <laughs> so you press the button, you'll go, oh, I can subscribe. Because he sees it come up on the screen. Right and, he, and he said to me the other day, he's like, oh, I need to get better at doing the intro. I was like, no, don't. <laughs> do not get better. Just be you. That's all I, yeah. want you to, all I just want you to be you. And if you start being super polished, people are like, this isn't Jay. This yeah, is the exactly. entertainment value that I get from Joe being a blithering idiot. Yeah. So, you <laughs> yes. know, I, it, I, he, he was kind of like that. He was like, I want to sort of be better. At, and I was like, no, you don't need to. Just be you. And it's, and it's gold so far. Why change it? You exactly. Know? Yeah. No, that's a really good point. I think I think the the natural feel that you guys have on screen, like and just the way you are interact with each other, I think it really does sell what you do as best as possible. I think you, you know the Top Gear analogy is like the best example of that. We've we've, we've fortunately been uh, lucky enough to have people say the same thing about our show. So. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. been a similar. It's been quite uh, on the review. Yeah, I think it, I think it helps. So when so for a while with the DZ and the Winters experience, I had guests coming in. Mm-hmm. And all of them were lovely people. And, you know, I had a great time with most of them. All of them. Um, <laughs> most of them. But the, but the thing that we do now, we have a team of people that are friends that know each other. And I've, I've kind of, this is where I've taken some inspiration from Lawrence and his team. And I'm going like, that chemistry that you build over time, you can't replicate that with a random guest, mm-hmm. I find. And if you do, it's rare and it's gold when yeah, it happens. Yeah. So because Joe and I and, and Brom and Eddie and, and Kyle and, and Paddy are all friends that have been now playing together for 18 months plus that chemistry makes it really easy to just be the same that we are and, and one of the biggest compliments we've ever had from anyone is when they meet you in person and you spend some time with someone at an event and they go he's just like he is on camera yeah and they said the same about paddy and they said the same about jay I'm like that's the best compliment we can get because it means we're not being fake we're just being us and then you're watching because we're being us which is a huge compliment so like yeah. that that's the i think that's the biggest thing for us and, and podcasts where you have like random guests but the three of you present all the time i think it becomes easy because it's just that natural chemistry it's like oh, it's tuesday we're recording yeah Off you go. yeah, no, yeah. No, it's exactly. funny with our show because we kind of got to know each other on the show almost like yeah at least oh, from, at least well, from we, we did we did with george really because like george started working and george was on the painting team but working yeah. from home so we kind of had met him a couple of times and chatted to him in that capacity but um it, we started recording the i think the first episode of the podcast you'd been in the office how long probably probably only like four weeks at a four post. weeks yeah, or something yeah, so we were just kind of really getting to know george in that way yeah i think and so that helped obviously me and james know each other for years but like that helped i think um it was like a set amount of time of all right let's all sit down and talk about painting but then as it's gone on it's like all conversations that we just have throughout the day anyway isn't it and then it is like, pretty much and then yeah. we'll be like Oh, we do that on the podcast. Yeah. Week, like, we're at the we... point now where we have to actively avoid talking about things yeah, yeah. to each other. They'll in the be office. like, we'll be yeah. like talking. I'll be like, save it. Yeah, I know. Stop. The amount of time Stop. Like, have you seen that new thing? Don't, don't talk about it now. Just <laughs> do not talk about it now. So yeah. we, on Thursday lunchtime, we do the Liam and Joe show where we just sit down on the on the podcast area yeah, yeah. and put it on live. And that we originally did that in the garage, and that came about because of the exact. So he would turn up, we start talking in my office at home, and I'm like, stop. Why aren't we recording this? <laughs> yeah. And then, so he's turned up and just sort of come to be silent. <laughs> yeah. All right, Joe. Yep. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Wait till the camera's on. Yep. <laughs> but that's how that show came. Like, we might as well put this on camera. That's the yeah. whole point of that. Yeah, yeah it's, it is. It is really good when it's that natural because if it, it, I, I, I feel that like sometimes if it, if it's forced, like you really have to put a lot of work into actually directing it and pushing it in a certain direction and yeah. stuff like that. Whereas that n- normalness of just having a conversation, you can't is, fake getting on with people and having no, good banter. Like you no. can't. But no. the, the biggest stress I find is because we do live streaming. So so when we did this, when we did the podcast, what was beautiful is after the two hours of recording, I'm like, 
I know what the video title is going to be. It's really easy because <laughs> there's a there's a catch line there, right? When you do live streaming, you have to schedule the stream before you go live. Yeah. So I sit there, I stress like, <laughs> what I'm, what's the topic going to be? Yeah. And, and I always go live, and I'm like, you know what, people don't pay attention to the topic because in ten minutes we'll be talking about something different yeah. <laughs> completely. Yeah. Um, that's the biggest stress. And that the, what's interesting with Joe is if you go and look at a lot of the shows I've done with him and you look at the title, I'll start with all intents and purposes, I'll start talking about that topic. And within 15 minutes, we're off on some tangent over here about something <laughs> completely different. Uh, and that happens all the time. Just a quick one. We wanted to remind you that you can get your own miniatures painted by the world-class team here at Seed Studios. We offer a variety of painting levels and services to meet your needs and budget. Whether you want a centerpiece character or an entire gaming army, we offer well above the industry standard of quality and experience. You can learn more about our services and get a quote now at cstudios.co.uk. And just for you podcast listeners, you can get 5% off of your first commission with us by using code PAINT5. Now back to the show. Well, speaking of tangents, <laughs> <laughs> let's, uh, let's try and segue into, yeah. our, into our topic for this week, uh, which is sort of circling back. We had a bit of a discussion before you came on the show, sort of things you'd like to talk about. And you raised a few points, but I actually think that they all were sort of circled into one. So we're kind of okay. going to have this as a broader conversation. I think this will just sort of become what it is uh, as the show unfolds. So staying motivated to paint. I'm terrible at it. <laughs> <laughs> so that's a starting point. <laughs> if you're someone who's a hobbyist, um, one of the points you raised was like about social media and how it can be discouraging. And we've spoken about that before on the show. Yeah. Um, lots. And me and James kind of hit this from a different angle of like, we love painting. And I'm on the complete other end of the spectrum where like, if you told me to play a game, that would be like my worst nightmare. Yeah. Um, so I don't struggle with motivation. As, I, I struggle with burnout potentially, but I don't struggle like finding a reason to want to paint in a world of like social media and like the new uh, painting technique of the week that's popular on YouTube. How can people sort of stay motivated with their projects if they're maybe not someone who loves painting as much as we do? Yeah. You said to me when I was on the podcast with you that you want to get back into painting world. Yeah. So, so what, what has happened with your painting? So uh, just so that uh, anyone that hasn't seen your channel and if you haven't, you should, um, <laughs> like really kind of like, what is it that's made you kind of lose that motivation? Cause like for us, like it, it the, we talk about this quite often about sort of like, I mean, George mentioned about burnout and things like that, but like staying motivated is a very hard thing, especially when you, when it's that investment of yeah. time. So, so what is it, what's happened with your painting? There's, there's, there's three things for me, I think. If I was to try and really put a pin in what, what's struggled, what's caused me to struggle with motivation, there's three main things. So the first thing, this is, and uh, I talked about this quite a lot on content recently in general, is uh, I'm pretty convinced now after the last few years, we've done, some, um, we've, we've done some learning around our children. I'm pretty convinced I have a severe case of ADHD, right? So my attention goes anyway. That's, that's a whole different thing. Um, so I've had to find ways of managing that. Um, the other thing, the other two issues with it though, is I've become with the channel specifically, I've become quite time poor and I struggle with the, I, I 100, like I know a lot of people that go, I'll, I'll paint for an hour and I put it away. I can't, I can't do an hour. I have to do more than like I have, by the time I've got my wet palette out and I, cause I also have to have a clear desk, right? So by the time I've got the palette out and I've got the, the cup out and I've got the paints out, that's 20 minutes done. Right. <laughs> so if I'm painting for 15, 20 minutes, 30 minutes and putting it away, it doesn't seem worth it. So I yeah, just yeah. don't get it out. Whereas when, I, when we get building, it's literally snip, snip, glue, good, put it to the side, happy days. And that's why I find that, personally, I find that quite easy to do. The third one for me, though, actually is directly linked to having the channel, and it is around social media. I said to you this morning, I think it was, I hate social media, which yeah. is ironic because I run a YouTube channel. Yeah. Um, but running the channel, I then built a Facebook page, built an Instagram page, built a Twitter page, all that kind of stuff, because you, you need to. Like yeah, it's yeah. part of the gig, essentially. Uh, and the biggest one at the time for me, at least, was Instagram. Um, and it's very, very easy on Instagram to find a ton of hobby content. Mm. But because of how Instagram works with the algorithm, what it and we spoke about this on the show, right? What it puts in front of you is just incredible artwork all the time <laughs> yeah. by people like David Soper, Rich Gray, Ang like Ango Graudes. That's what it puts in front of you. And you're like, this is the standard now. Yeah, <laughs> It's not. But that's what it shows you. That's what you yeah. think is the standard. So then I, I, I would, like I'd start painting something. I'd, I, it wouldn't be the neatest work, but it's not supposed to be at this stage. You'd put the wash on, you'd open social media, you'd look at what they've done and you'd want to throw yours in the bin. So when I then, when I then combine that to being time poor, I think, well, to get to that standard, I'm going to need to put hours in. I don't have that time. And that's basically why I just sort of stopped, looked flat stopped painting for the longest time. So, what, so when was the last time you picked up a brush to actually- I painted- paint? uh, <laughs> I painted the striking scorpions, the new ones that came out yep. badly, but I painted them completely. Um, and it was, 
stress <laughs> to say that it's so like, when, when they got announced joe has always been teasing me because i eldar was always my main has always been one of my main factions and he was always teasing me he's like they're, they're mine i was like no no, they're not he's like Liam, you don't paint anything so you're gonna have to give them to me or we won't get them on the channel and i was like challenge accepted mm -hmm. because that's the one thing i think that will override my kind of procrastination is if someone challenges me like really challenges me to do something so he he really dug into the fact that i wasn't going to get them done so i went and found uh, a couple of guides around things like contrast so i could kind of find methods that sped up for me what are some of the harder stages of painting uh, and i did the scorpions and i there was this really kind of juxtaposition at the end of finishing them on the one on the one hand i was like i've, I've painted a squad of models on the other hand i was like they're really <laughs> bad to what compared to what i'm used to um because when i painted years ago my standard got relatively good mm. um and so I was, it was a real like a win-lose situation at that point. I was really happy like painting something, but really like this, I could have done a better job there. And Joe, and then I sit there, Joe's quite a competent painter on, and he's very quick. And I was like, he probably would have done a better job than me and I probably should have given them to him. And that was that, that was a, I was in a really weird space then because I wanted to be really proud of the fact that I'd actually painted a unit, but then also I was like, but they're not actually that good. And they probably need a lot more with some time, they can be tidied up, they can be neat and I can add some highlighting in and really make them pop. And then I get back to the, I'm time poor and I get distracted easily. And but then equally as well, like this is something that I'm sort of trying to come to terms with recently. It's like, do they need to look as best as possible? Like I think, like you said on the Instagram thing, I think it's kind of trained us to all think that like everything you paint has to be incredible. Yes. Yeah. A hundred percent. Absolutely. Yeah. And the perfectionist that we talked about, like production quality and content, the, perfect, the perfectionist in me, picks up faults and errors in every single game stream that we put out there mm. without fail. And there's things I notice that people won't notice just because I'm really picky, which is I can solve those problems with, when it comes to the production of the show. Yep. I, I know cameras, I know microphones, I know computers, I can solve those problems and I'm constantly working behind the scenes to fix some of the issues. With painting, in my mind at least, and you like almost shout at me, there's a, there's a degree of natural ability that I think that sometimes I'm like, well, I, I just can't, I'm never going to be able to do that. So that then frustrates me because I can't hit that perfect that you see on social media. Yeah. Well, I feel like with the natural ability thing, it's like, I always felt that way about myself when it comes to artistic stuff. I think, again, on one of the earliest episodes we ever did, I spoke about how I'd never been like an artistic child or like I'd never done painting as a kid at yeah. all. Never, never good at drawing, never like any of that. Um, and I have a lot of the same situations that you, what you're talking about where like, yeah, I can finish a model, but part of the reason I hardly ever finish a model is because I'm always like, oh, but it's not going to look good. So like, yeah. what's the point? Yeah. Like, so I might as well just carry on going kind of thing. And then I still get rinsed from these two because I haven't finished <laughs> the model. So it's like, well, I might as well have just done it badly that at least it's finished. Um, or just, I might as well just paint the front of it or something. Yeah. Yeah. Just, just paint um, the front. For pictures. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, it, it, ultimately, I think when, when you talk about those things, you actually say them out loud. You kind of realize like, oh, yeah, it's just supposed to be fun as well, isn't it? Yeah. Like I can yeah. just have like fun painting some models. They don't have to look like Rich Gray painted them. We spoke <laughs> like, about that like to death on this show. It's like you should do what makes you enjoy the hobby. Yeah. And if that's another pillar of the hobby, then like I'd probably just segue into that, right? As like uh, a commission painter, it's forced me to be okay with not painting to my best all the time mm. reluctantly and it's a very difficult struggle for me and it's something that i've kind of as i've segued more into you know working in the office here i don't do as much uh, commission painting as i used to and i've kind of had to force myself to take a bit of a step back with that because now i've started to do uh, my own uh, warhammer army for the first time um in all of these years i've only ever been commission painting i've never done my own project and realizing that i am a bit time poor and that I'm going to have to be okay with if I'm going to do like 150 models and no one's going to pay me for it. I'm going to have to probably not do them to the best of my ability and try to find yeah. those shortcuts that I'm okay with. But coming to the realization that if you're just enjoying it, which is what I've said on the show you're supposed to do. Yeah, to like yeah. Follow my own advice of like, if you're just doing this to enjoy sitting down and painting for two hours every evening, the outcome shouldn't really be what you're too focused on. But do you not, like as Siege, do you not find Instagram a stress? For example, because you're uh, yeah. selling right, so you're selling a painting service. Yeah. So the, I think that perhaps there's an expectation that what you put on social media is got to be the best because you're trying to charge people to, to to produce that product. Correct. Yeah. And I I sit in a similar, not quite the same space. I'm not selling painted models, but we're selling 
um, visual product. We're selling video, stream, etc. Yeah. So I feel like there's a mad stress on on as a person who's supposed to be one of these influencers. I hate the word, but it's what people use. Like I feel like there's an expectation for me to produce a certain quality where he does it for a living, so he must be good at it. Your expertise, yeah, yeah. Like. like for yeah. people to always look at what you're going and going. Oh yeah, they they definitely know what they're talking about or something like that. Hundred percent. Because we, because we're ultimately, you know, I, we do, I do this full time now. So we we try and encourage people to become channel members. We try and encourage people to engage with streams. Um, and part of that is about the entertainment value, but part of that's also about being experts of the product and, and knowing, like, we get to get, we get GW luckily send us products to review and stuff like that. And we don't, you know, I, I hold my hands up. We don't always get it right. And what's weird is, I'm I'm kind of more okay with putting a new detachment on stream and getting one of the rules slightly wrong than I am with putting a subpar painted model on Instagram, despite the fact that actually the first one is kind of more our core product than the second. And it's a weird, I, I don't know if it's just a me mindset, but it's just a weird space to be. I think people are more accepting of the fact that there's a billion rules in Warhammer 40k. So if they get one of them wrong, that's okay. But if you don't quite paint that lens right, and it's, I, it's, yeah. I think it's on me. I, I, I do. Uh, yeah, I wonder if that's more that you're because you're more knowledgeable of the game inside or more have more experience with the game inside you're maybe more aware of the fact that yeah people do get rules wrong sometimes it's not actually that big a deal even gw yeah exactly so uh -huh. like whereas because you don't have that experience on the painting side your perception is that everyone gets everything right all the time yeah. when actually it's the same thing like we're probably more comfortable not necessarily getting something wrong on the painting side but like in our personal lives anyway, not with our personal hobby rather than the service, because obviously the service has to be right because people yeah. are paying for it and we go through quality control checks and fix problems and things like that. But like on our personal thing, it's like we're aware that, yeah, people don't always paint something to the highest level that they can and, and there's but, certain things that can look a little bit like not perfect if you're just paying something to play with a game or something. I mean, that's what I was talking about with the doing the commissions thing because... For example, like with Siege, we have our different painting levels to accommodate for different budgets and different scales of project and that sort of thing. So if as a commission painter, if I'm working on a project that's to our bronze level, which looks fantastic, but isn't the highest quality that I can paint, I uh, sometimes like early on sort of felt that of like going to post something. It's like, I don't want people to think that this is the best that I can do. But yeah, equally, yeah. I'm, I'm proud of what I've done and I want to show people. It is, it's, it's the unfortunate circumstances with seeing what you see on social media at face value. Like a picture doesn't convey any of the nuances that go behind it. So like those exact things that you said, or for example, you might've been unwell, or for example, like the, the brush you're using might not be performing very well, or the paint might have you've left it too long and it's dried a certain way. Or the way. deadline was super tight, or, like when we've been painting projects like Leviathan, that sort of thing. Exactly, yeah. like there's loads, of, there's loads of little nuances that just a picture does not convey so yeah, that yeah. person viewing it you, you 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 see it for what it is does that make sense and that goes both ways because when you see something that is unbelievable you forget the bit that that person's a professional painter they paint for 12 hours a day yeah, they're being yeah. paid to do that and that model took them 597 hours yeah, yeah. exactly but, yeah but you've also got you're also fighting that social media algorithm we've talked about the algorithm yeah, and, yeah. and the problem is if you've got if i put a picture of my scorpion up and rich gray puts a picture of mortarian's wing up right I know which one's getting more likes. Mm. I'm not. I'm not naive. I know which one's going to get more engagement. So what happens with the AI algorithm for Instagram is Rich's post gets more engagement because it's flat better than mine. It's incredible, in fact. So what that then does is that then puts that picture in front of more people rather than my picture. So then my my Instagram feed will be filled of Rich Gray based posts because they're the ones that get high high based out, um, engagement and not me type posts. So then I look at everyone around me. I'm like everyone's better than me. I'm just rubbish. But there's it. kind of some selection bias there though, because you're only being pushed the stuff that's popular and yes. you don't see the amazing stuff that's not getting the likes. Exactly. Yeah. So yeah. it kind of cuts both ways. And equally, there's plenty of stuff that's like nice, like hobby level stuff that gets like loads of likes because it's like super engaging post or for whatever reason it was pushed to a lot of people. Yeah. So sometimes just because it's got loads of likes doesn't mean it's good or bad and, cause, and vice versa, yeah, yeah. it's not got a lot. I mean, there's been plenty of projects where uh, they've come into the office and we've seen the model that someone's painted from the team. It's absolutely incredible. We're like, this is a banger. It's going up 6 p.m. tonight. It's gonna, everyone's gonna love it. And then just crickets. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, you know? mate. Yeah. That, it's the same. With, that's the same with content as well, though. It's the algorithm is horrific. I hate it. It keeps me up at night sometimes. <laughs> you'll put something out. You'll you'll do a stream. You'll be like, that was incredible. How many people were watching? Like three. Good. Okay. I'm so glad we put all that effort in. <laughs> and, and then you'll be another one like, oh, what armies are playing? Don't care. What mission we're playing? Don't care. And we go live. It's like, how many people watching? 500. Oh God. <laughs> you need to perform now. Yeah. It happens all the time. It's just, I, I guess that's one of the things we're kind of beholden to when we create content is the algorithm. But I also think it's, it's 
worked negatively for me for my painting motivation. Genuinely, I think it has. So I've recently made a second Instagram page, which is about another thing I love, motorbikes. It's another thing I enjoy. And that is now my default open page on Instagram. Mm. So when I open it and I sit there doom scrolling because I've got five minutes, I actually am I'm filled with content around motorcycles rather than painting. And I've done that on purpose to kind of remove myself from that. So if I need to do something hobby, I'll open the Instagram hobby, post it, and I'll close it again. Mm. I do it on purpose. So I'm not surrounding myself with these incredible images all the time. And I'm actually finding it's helping me. Like my hobby motivation, at least, not painting yet, but my hobby motivation has gone up in the last few months because I'm not surrounded by all these epic things people are doing all the time. <laughs> yeah. And I'm just able to live in my own little world now and go, uh, we, uh, uh, I think I've heard you say this so many times and I think we spoke about it before. And I'm like, as long as one of the, as long as the thing I'm doing is perhaps slightly better than the last thing I did, yeah. then I'm making progress and that's, I, I that's positive. Yeah. yeah, I mean, 100%. Yeah. On like a personal sort of side question then. So for you uh, in the hobby, what is, what is like the most enjoyable part of it for you? Like what gives you, what do you find the most fun to do? You, you said building, but is that, the, is that the, is that like- Is that the just light? the least objectionable yeah. or is that actually <laughs> enjoyable? <laughs> uh, building's like, I guess it's the easiest to, building is, I can build for days and days and days and not have problems. And I have mountains and mountains of nicely cleaned, nicely built plastic that then stay grey. Um, I actually, when I was painting, um, I really enjoyed the process. And I had some models that I did that I was very proud of. Um, and then I have, at the moment at least, right, a lot, there's a lot of stuff out there in the world about 10th edition is terrible right now. I'm having the most fun playing this game. And I don't necessarily think it's my, it's not my favourite edition by a long way. Um, because I started back in sort of, like properly playing back in 5th edition. Uh, but I'm having so much fun right now. Um, so it's, it's actually really hard to pick a favorite part of the hobby. Yeah. And so the, the channel kind of just tries to cover everything because I legitimately just enjoy all of it. Um, I'm super invested in the lore and the narrative. I've got God knows hundreds of books on Audible and I listen to them, you know, I listen to people reading them to me on a drive to places like this as well. Yeah. So I, I can't, I find it really difficult to shoehorn and be a, I'm a law guy or I'm a building guy because I just, I enjoy every aspect of it. Okay. Let's say like within the hobby, like painting, building bubble, is it, is there anything like painting wise that you quite enjoy part of the process or is it just the, the building? My, my favorite thing, my favorite thing in painting is blending power weapons. Okay. So that's, I didn't know how to do that four years ago. A friend of mine, Martin Waller, uh, I went up to, I visited him at his house because I was like, I don't know how to, to do this thing. And he, he taught me how to blend. Um, and well, how he does it at least anyway. He does some incredible work. He's mega. And I went home and I took exactly what he taught me and I applied it. And of course, the first time I did it, it didn't look like what he'd done. Um, and I was a bit more impatient than he was because he, when he showed me, he spent three hours painting the lapel triangle of a Harlequin <laughs> and getting this beautiful transition. And I applied it to a power sword and I didn't have quite the same transition despite the fact I did it an hour and a half and he did the lapel in three hours. So I was never going to achieve the same result, but I did it and I had a transition. And I spent a lot of time um, working on that. And now I think I can do a really good job of it. The downside I have is, oh, like I, I had three Necron score pack, right? And I painted one of the one sides of one of the blades with this green transition. And I was so happy with it at the end. And then I was like, got to do that on all of them now <laughs> <laughs> to make them the same. That is it, that's yeah. my favorite thing to paint, like power weapon transitions, the blues or the greens. I, I love doing that stuff. That's really, really, really and that's, good. And I've got to say that like, for someone who doesn't seem to like, when you we first spoke about painting, like, that as a t like blending as the technical aspect of it, and then obviously just placing light in different areas and things like that, or the way that like, the energy is refracting on the blade. That's quite an advanced. That's an, that's an advanced <laughs> yeah. thing. So it's like I see the uh, I see the difficulty with not having much time, and also my favorite thing to do is blend power <laughs> weapons. <laughs> <laughs> but that, like it's not just power weapons. I do it on I do it on robes and capes now. Yeah, I, yeah. I took that technique that he did that he showed me that I was like, I can do this thing. And how do I apply it to everything? How do I apply it to every armor panel? How do I apply it to capes? Which means that it now takes me about four to five years to paint one model. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, that's so funny because I had a very similar situation. When I started working here, I went on one of James's uh, essentials courses like to take some pictures and stuff. So I picked up some information like while I was there. Yeah. And then when we come back, I was like, can I actually like do one of those? And he was like, yeah. So next one that was at Element Games, we went up there and I did the course like, like with everyone. And uh, on that, you go over like blazing blend in. and blending yeah. and, and all this and specifically robes and faces and whatever. And uh, when I got home and I'd unlocked this glazing <laughs> thing that I didn't, I didn't think that I was scared of previously, like I didn't think I'd be able to do. I was glazing everything, yeah. all the robes, everything. And like, I remember turning up for like my next um, gaming thing. I was doing a lot of kill team, kill team at the time. 
and uh and i had like they were doing the commanders so we had like characters and stuff and i'd done a character and it was like just glazing all over it looked so good it looked way better than everything i'd ever done and i put that down and i remember everyone being like who are you like what are you doing <laughs> what's happened here like why aren't they just dry brushed like, and i was like well I've, I've got this new thing that i'm trying <laughs> Big news, tickets are now on sale for the Siege Studios painting classes for 2024. For over eight years, we've been running in-depth, hands-on classes across the UK, which has allowed us to create the perfect learning environment for improving your painting skills. With a variety of topics available, all our courses are taught by senior artists and feature practical demonstrations in a relaxed environment that welcomes interaction from you, discussions on theory, and an open Q&A session so you can ask that burning question you've had on your mind. You can even bring your models for feedback. To book now and reserve your place before tickets set out, head over to siegestudios.co.uk forward slash shop. I'll see you on a class soon. So, so I want to circle back a little bit because it's because we you said something and for me it's stuck and I wanted to talk about it. So, the the reason you painted the striking scorpions is because you were set a challenge. Kind of, yeah. yeah. Now that's really interesting because I I always say that like outside your comfort zone or someone saying something like you can't do it or you're not possible or you're not able to do it or you won't get it done or that kind of stuff that synergizes with me massively because I love a challenge. Yeah. Like. Yeah, me and Joe have been uh, exchanging glances. Uh, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I do, I do love a challenge, and and like what I'm, I'm saying is, I wish that reverse psychology worked as well on James as it did with you. With <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like there are things that, like for me, like are, that are challenges, and like, but I, I but I, I do definitely want to do want to talk about that point with you because it was it, Joe saying that to you and saying, yeah, but you you won't get them done or whatever the case may be. Like that made you go, well, well, no, I'm, I'm, I'm going to. So you, at that point, you were like, right, well, I, I'm going to do it and commit to yeah. it. So, so what is it about that 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 made? What is it specific about that situation with the, with the striking schools that made you go? Do you know what? Look, I'm gonna this thing that maybe I, you know, I, there's a bit of trepidation, or maybe I, I'll see all this stuff online, or what made you then go right? Well, I want to, I want to, I want to do that. I think, I, so I think part of the problem was because it came from Joe. Right. So, so Joe's a person now I've been working with. For for over two years, he knows me incredibly well. Um, more importantly, he knows my work life and my time schedule and all that kind of stuff very well because mm -hmm. you know, we work very closely together. So I can have a similar I can have a similar comment from someone out in the community, and I'll, I'll just water off a doctor. They don't really know me, yeah, yeah. So I'm not. I'm like, cool. You've made an assumption. That's fine. We all do it. But you don't really know me. You don't know how busy I am. You don't know what my schedule or my life or my family's like. But Joe does know me. He does know me very, very well. So when he started throwing that, you're never going to get that done. You just won't do it. You'll find an excuse not to do it. I was like, he really knows me. <laughs> and at that point, I was like, I just want to prove a person who does know me quite well, I want to prove him wrong and that I can do this thing. Uh, it also helped that it was a faction that I loved. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, I also didn't want to hand these news. I, I spent I spent two years now, whenever G Games Workshop sent me something new um, that we want to get ready for the channel, of basically taking the box from the postman and then going, there you go, Jay. And I've not had the the joy or pleasure of opening that box, you know, for the, having that kit for the first time. Uh, and it's happened with so many things. World Eaters is my, one of my other main and favorite factions. Um, and when the, the new World Eaters release happened, um, they sent us through a bunch of stuff. And I said to GW, I was like, I actually need more. T to do a new army, I need more of the stuff. And they sent me some extra stuff. And again, all of it, my favorite, one of my favorite factions, one of my two favorite factions, Eldar World Eaters. And I gave it all to Joe, sealed in a box, because I knew if I opened it, I wouldn't hand it over. And I knew if I didn't hand it over, it wasn't going to be ready for the stream. So I handed him Angron and all the new Berserkers and, and Eight Bound, all that kind of stuff. And Joe, fair play to him, he, he got it all painted up, got it all ready for us to run streams as soon as the codex dropped. Um, but I'd had so long of handing that stuff over. I was like, I don't want to be in a position again where yet, like I've been waiting for stri plastic striping scorpions for, for literally years. You know? <laughs> yeah. There's 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 Eldar sculpts older than George's, right? <laughs> that, was, that's true. <laughs> that's not even an exaggeration. Anyway, I, I, genuinely, right? and I was like, I don't want to hold. I want to. I don't want to hand these ones over. I, yeah. I, I really want. Like I've been waiting for these for ages. I've talked about plastic aspect warriors forever. Am I really going to be the guy that then finally gets them and goes, "There you go, Jay. Go paint those." Yeah. So I think there's a combination of like I'd, I'd spent so long handing over and not having that kind of joy, joy of new plastic, and then Joe, who knows me. Not being like, I understand that you're, you're really busy, Liam. He'd just be like, you won't do it. I'm going to prove you wrong then. Yeah. And I did. And, you know, I painted them and we used them on the channel. And I was really happy to put them on the table and be like, I did them. Yeah. But I do pick them up and go, they're not very good. You can. Well, that's the beauty of it is now that they're where they're at, you can always, even with the limited time that you've got, you've got that, that 
that affinity with those models because of your enjoyment of the, the faction and, and, and obviously the, the, that you painted them. You can always add more to them. So yeah, I, I always, I think I always try and tell myself that that's the case. I always try and tell myself that this standard is fine and I can come back and add highlights or extra colors or whatever. But then I start painting. And what I, here's, what I, here's my process, right? So <laughs> what I'll do is I'll, let's take Converserkers. I'll build the 10, the 10 models. Cool, I built them. I'm really happy with them. They're all clean. They're all on custom bases and there's a little bit of modification to them because I'm really, I, like, I love the building aspect. I have to have, every model has to be different. I can't have duplicates. And then I'll get them all base coated. And I, typically nowadays, I'll airbrush all the base color on. Yep. So red for world years. And then I'll pick one up and I'll paint all the, the trim. And then I'll probably pick another one up and do it. And I get to a point where all 10 might have the trim done. And then I'll pick the first one up again and I'll start doing a detail. And my mind says, just do the leather on all of them. But once I've done the leather on that one, I'm like, you're starting to look all right now. And then I'll do the lenses. <laughs> then, I'll, then I'll do the power weapon. And, then I'll do the, and, then, and then before you know it, I've spent literal days painting this one to a standard where I'd be actually quite happy to put it on my social media. Yep. And then I look at the other nine, I'm like, oh, <laughs> I've, got to, I've got to do this or those now. Yep. And that's where I really fall down. I, I end up like kind of really like hyper-focusing on the one model. And then when you come sort of take a step back and look at the wider picture and realize there's, there's not just 10 actually, because the list has 30 berserkers in it. There's 30 <laughs> to do. You think like, oh. And then that's, like, if that goes away in the cupboard, it's not my problem anymore. <laughs> Shut the door. Ignore it. On a, on a hobby level, though, in terms of just like pure enjoyment and putting aside like maybe uh, painting for YouTube and that sort of thing, I don't, I, I've always really loved like a similar thing. Actually, I'll often sit there to batch paint stuff and I'll get a bit too carried away with one model. I think we all we've do all that. done it. Like, yeah. And then you just tell yourself, well, that's the test model. I'm just, yeah, yeah. I'm just, I was just testing, it. Checking I was just testing the, the scheme. I'm just checking that it all works yeah. and then I'll do the others later. <laughs> yeah. But if in, in the spirit of just enjoying the hobby, why not just do that one model? Do you know what I mean? Like, I think we're sort of, I feel like we're fighting ourselves because we don't like really want to paint 10 a lot of the time, especially when it's like generic infantry. Yeah. Like sometimes you see a new box, a new model, and you're like, oh, I really want to paint them. It's like, you probably want to paint one. Yeah. You know what I mean? Absolutely. I found a lot of joy in just painting like single, especially for a faction that I have like no affinity to, just for like a little palette cleanser. Like, I just want to paint a Gene Steeler, like Neophyte hybrid, and just paint one. I've, I found a lot of fun just doing that. Well, before I painted the Scorpions, I actually um, painted one of the new Hormigan models. And I bought a box of them and I painted one of them um, just because I wanted to, because I thought they were beautiful new skulls, yeah. very dynamic. Um, and that was part of that, that genuine actually helped me paint the scorpions because I, I, that was that particular model, I'd use a lot of contrast on it. And I just, the first time I'd ever used it, um, I'd never really, I tried using contrast when it first came out and I hated it and I wasn't using it properly, to be honest with you. Uh, and there's a guy out there, a guy called Josh, who runs a channel called Warhipster, uh, who's a friend of mine. He was like, no, no. And he did, he did a load, he, he sort of, Gave me a load of tips and tricks and stuff like that. And, and I did this, this Hormigan and it came out really nicely. It looked great. The, the paint on kind of fleshy tones, that paint works really well on those kinds of, on those kinds of surfaces. Yeah. Um, so that was, uh, that was really kind of satisfying. Now, Scorpions, although they're armored, because they're Eldar armored, they also have lots of bumps and grooves and, and kind of recesses and stuff. So actually, contrast works quite well on those as well. And that basically gave me enough to go, if I apply that paint, kind of methodology to that model that I think I'm still going to get a decent result. That really helped. I, I think I'd like to paint more individual models for that exact reason. But I also feel because the channel does games, there's an expectation that if I'm not painting an army, am I just wasting my time? Yeah. And then I have that really weird, you probably felt the same, all of you probably felt the same, that really weird blur between job and hobby. Mm. Like, I actually can do a single model if I'm doing it as my hobby time. And maybe if I was doing it on work time, it is wasting my time. But what is defined as work time versus personal time when you run your own business? There yeah. kind of isn't really a definition there. Well, as um, a commission painter, that was what I struggled with for the longest time because it was like I was painting all day and I just loved painting. So it was it was amazing. And then sometimes I would think about like, oh, I should like start my own project. And that's why I'd always kind of failed because I'd be painting at home being like, well, I could just be like chipping away at that project and like getting paid for this. So it seems like yeah. a bit of a waste of time because yeah. I, just, I just like painting. So why not just paint other people's stuff? Yeah. Um, and that's hence the failed Sons of Horus army. And, uh, <laughs> probably soon to be failed Blood Angels. But uh, now you're right. In, stick, stay on the path. But you're six models in. You're yeah. I'm not, even, I'm not even six. <laughs> <laughs> I was giving you kudos then. Come on. Like, no, you know. no, not that far yet. But interestingly, um, something which like circling back again, you spoke about how you've got like, you love the building and cleaning. You've got like loads of built and clean models that are ready for paint. I've always found this interesting. There's a lot of like stigma around people that play with like just primed black models or unpainted models or partially finished models. And if you're someone who doesn't like painting, I've never understood that because 
if I just want a game and people put up this like artificial barrier of like we've got paint on these models, if you don't enjoy doing that, why would you bother? It's a very device, divisive topic. This we've done some content on this lately, and it's very divisive in the community. I personally wouldn't want to play without painted models. I have no problem playing against someone who doesn't have painted models. Now, GW have arguably set a precedent here, right? Because if you play Leviathan, you get 50 points for your primary, 40 points for your secondary, and 10 points for being painted. And I would argue that they're saying it's okay to not be painted. A lot of people would argue that 10 points isn't enough of a penalty for not having a painted army. And actually, some of the stronger meta armies can just breeze out 90 points and don't care about not getting those 10 points for painted and still win. But they, I feel like that's a message. Like the GW are saying, we're all inclusive. Yeah, like, yeah. If you don't want to paint, don't paint. You're just not going to get 10 points. Sometimes I've been at events where someone hasn't had a fully painted army, maybe like half painted and a lot of stuff is, some of it's gray. And a person will still give them the points. I'm like, I mean, you should feel empowered to say you're not getting your 10 points because it's not fully painted, which is fine. It's perfectly okay. That's why it's there as a, an award for someone painting. So, but I, I do find it, I do find there is a little, there's a little bit of gatekeeping. And there's a little barrier that it does exist from some people at least that are like, nope, if it's not painted, you're not playing. Mm, why? Like, the, the the bonus with what we what we have here is it's a hobby that has it's multifaceted. You've yeah. got the law, the building, the painting, the playing. There's so much of it. Not everyone has to enjoy every single aspect. Yeah, um, it's one of the barriers that I've kind of like. Well, not even a barrier. It's kind of like a safety net that I've always put up with me, like not playing as well. It's because I, I, I it, the game appeals to me as like an idea, but I know that I'm not great at games, and I know it's quite an obstacle to overcome. Neither am I, George. <laughs> <laughs> but. I've always kind of had that as like my safety net of like, well, if I wanted to play a game, I'd have to have a full painted army and I just don't have the time. So that's an excuse not to play the game. Yeah. And even with like Joe spoke, um, Joe spoke to me about wanting to get into Underworlds and he said that that'd be like perfect for me because it's just a small war band. It's basically a board game. And even then I'm like, yeah, but I'd have to paint like the war band and that's like five models. <laughs> Three and models. My friends, and my friends don't paint. So I'd have to like paint their war band for them as well. So they're yeah. now in for like 10 models and I just don't have the time. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. Um, but stupidly not following my own advice i could just buy that box put the models together not paint them, and then play the game and learn a game i often find as well in my personal experience a lot of people will if they play with unpainted models it actually then helps the motivation to go and paint yeah especially if they go like i, I there was a experience i had at ipswich years ago where i used to be based and people would turn up um the gw and ipswich had a had pretty good rule like you can bring whatever you want if it's unpainted it's unpainted we'd like to see progress but that meant that a person could turn up with an army of, of gray plastic. And if he's playing against a, a player, another player who's got a fully painted army, you'd often find people will come away going, it's achievable. He's done it. And then they, they want to start painting. And they want to make, they want to turn up for someone going, oh, you've made some progress. It kind of encourages it. If you put that barrier of entry up like at that high level immediately, you have to have a fully painted force, fully based, et cetera, before you're even allowed to go on the tabletop. That I think runs a risk of people losing interest. Yeah. And be like, well, I wanted to play and now I don't really want to play. There's a guy in my community, a guy called David, uh, who's a, one of the channel members who hates painting. And he's got, I dread to think how many armies, fully assembled, not painted. And he's like, I don't care. I just want to play the game. But I, 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 he cares more about the, the game mechanics and actually playing the game yeah. than he does about painting. Yeah. I'm like, power, and he, but he gets so much stick for it. Well, I think he's more of a winner than someone who's like, got this half painted army that's not finished and they never play the game. He's not restricting himself by a fake barrier that really doesn't exist. Yeah. Um, but we I, all think that barrier exists, you yeah. know. I think you're quite right with the ten points thing. I think like then it's not like it's like you have to have a painted army to game. It's just like that's like a reward for the effort that you put in to do it. It's like you can still play the game completely with models that are unpainted. But if you do have painted, well, there's something for yeah the effort. And I ultimately think that painting miniatures, you do have to put a lot of investment of time and effort into it. So it makes sense to have that kind of like little nod to the effort that you put in, in into actually presenting something that you've invested a lot of time into yeah um, it should be like a it's a reward not we're not taking it away from you if you don't do yeah, it yeah. We're giving yeah. it to you if you do do it but. yeah it's interesting if that is their kind of stance on it now because i don't know if this was like an official stance but one of the reasons i stopped having an interest in warhammer as a kid originally was that i was going to gw stores to play and i wasn't painting much i didn't really have anything to paint with i didn't have any anyone to paint with didn't know what i was doing so i'd sprayed my models that i'd built badly and um caked some paint on them straight out the pot probably i was like yeah. 10 or well 11 it. or whatever right. and then i was going to these uh i was going to gw on a on a weekend and it started to get to the point of where i was like i was basically told 
if they weren't painted, I couldn't come back next week. Yeah. And I remember thinking, like, as a kid, I was, like, so, like, embarrassed and, like, on the spot or whatever that I just did. That's how I, like, fell out of Warhammer kind of thing. So I think having that barrier up, especially for people that you're trying to get into the game, is definitely a bad thing. So if they have swayed on that. I also remember even, like, as an adult coming back to it, I don't, again, I don't know what the rules are now, and I don't think these rules were ever actually enforced as far as I remember, but I remember going to Warhammer World and the rules being like, if you were playing on their tables, it had to be fully painted and stuff like that. I, I went up there without a fully painted army and played loads of times. No one seemed to have an issue, but I do remember like having that rule in place, yeah. at least written down somewhere, was making me think like, Oh, am I gonna like not be welcome there, or like are people gonna so, like you know what I mean? So you know people really get funny about it. Right? We, so I, as I said to you earlier, right? we've done some content around this, and there's some really, there's some really interesting things that have come out. Um, so I, I, I talk a lot about accessibility in the hobby in general, um, and one of the things we try and do is we try and we try and break down some of those barriers of accessibility. And I'd like to think that people can watch the content and enjoy it, even if they don't really know what's going on on the table or they don't understand the game. That's an accessibility thing. GW have done a lot of stuff over the course of the last, I don't know how many years, to improve accessibility. They're all over social media now, which they weren't before. Um, you know, they have uh, push fit models to get people started. They have start collecting boxes. They have starter sets. They're doing lots and lots and lots of stuff to try and bring people in who are new, who you know previously might not have been interested. The whole kind of concept of 10th edition supposedly was to improve accessibility. And I still think it's quite a complicated game, but a lot of, there's a lot of people that I've spoken to that are like, I've come back because it's easy to understand. So they're arguably they're doing a good job there. Um, but even like my my eldest two three years ago tried to get into Sigma. They had a little booklet. Like you get a little stamp for building your first model. You get a little stamp for paint. Like there's loads of stuff to encourage people like kids on their hobby journey. When we talk, I, I talked about this recently because we were focusing on this this new upcoming Amazon deal with um with uh, Henry Carvel's involvement and televising essentially Warhammer 40k. And I said that for, for, from my perspective, GW need to get their accessibility spot on at just the point all that stuff goes live because we have. There's a potential at the moment for this hobby to go borderline stratospheric and, and really mainstream in the very near future with this deal. Um, because I think the TV show and the films will bring people in and be like, what's that? Uh, we were talking literally last night, Call of Duty have just announced a Warhammer skins in Warzone. And a lot of people, if you read the comments on things like Twitter, they'll be like, what is this? And what, what do you think they're going to do? They're probably going to start Googling and they're going to have a look. And it might be something where they go, I'm quite interested in this now. And it might bring people in. Mm. And I think that's obviously Games Workshop's intent is to bring people in. And I've said that they need to lower that accessibility barrier so that when someone approaches the hobby for the first time ever, they're not terrified of 2,000 points of 600 orcs all with 17 different layers of highlights because that's someone's going to go, oh, I'm never going to be able to do that. I'm not, I'm not going to bother. And culturally within the hobby as well, that needs to change of like people being okay with seeing less. Well, so some of the comments we've had is, no, I don't want those people in my hobby. I'm like, Why would you not want more people in the hobby? Exactly, yeah. I think yeah. It's, a, it's the exact same thing though as like, so when all the Marvel stuff started kicking off with films in terms of being big, so not right at the start, but let's say like Avengers is coming out or whatever. Yeah, yeah, 20... Are you talking like Iron Man when Iron Man was Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So when it started started again, basically, or, or whatever, and Avengers comes out in like, what, 2012 or something, 2011. I think in the, the, the amount of people that then went and read comic books that had never read comic yep. books, it w went through the roof. Um, and even me as an adult, going back to reading comic books. I was going, I went back to reading weekly comics. I hadn't done that in, I hadn't done that since I was like 14. I was um, like around that sort of age when those Marvel movies came out and I remember getting into comic books because of them. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Like, so it's the same thing. The comics to that is the, is the game and the painting and everything to, to this. So it has the potential if it takes off even like 5%. I mean, how many people read Game of Thrones who had never heard of Game of Thrones or read yeah. the, the, whatever the book's actually called? because they'd never actually heard of yeah. it before because of the show like it has that effect but within all of those fan bases you have the existing people who don't want those new people in which always baffles me yeah really really like, but you're true it, it's happened with so many things it's happened with happened with Lord of the Rings it's happened with Harry Potter people see the films that's a cool film and then they find out it's a book this I think this is exactly what's going to happen in the Warhammer universe people will see the TV shows and the films They'll probably find the narrative next. That's the next logical step. Yeah, yeah. And then, and then with a bit more googling and a bit more the way that things like cookies and algorithms work, they're probably going to start to see models. And then, from my perspective, you know, very selfishly, I run a business that is around this hobby. I want more people involved because I have a bigger potential audience, I have a bigger potential customer base. 
Um, but moreover, I, I'm one of those people that's like, the bigger the hobby grows, the more potential wonderful people I get to meet is the most important thing for me. Mm. Um, I've met some amazing people in the hobby uh, just because of the hobby. And I, I say this a lot, right? Uh, this is a, a phrase I put out there for my community loads, and I genuinely believe in this. Uh, and our Friday night show is actually testament to this because on our Friday night show, we basically don't talk about 40K. We start, and then we end up ranting about airports, and I tell a story about <laughs> having a vasectomy. Like, oh, genuinely, right? That's actual content that's happened. And I always say, 40K is the reason why we've been brought together, but it's not necessarily the reason why we continue to spend time with each other. Mm. It's the reason why we've all found each other, but it's not necessarily the thing that, that holds us there. And I think that's a, a wonderful thing about this hobby. You can walk into a room at an event with, with 50 other people and know none of them, but you've instantly got common ground. Yeah. Whatever that might be, you've instantly got common ground and you instantly have something to talk to them about. And that's quite special. Mm. And it's quite rare as well. Like if you walked into a, a pub of 50 people that you didn't know and they're all people that didn't know, you'd be like, so what do we talk about? <laughs> but I can go, well, what armies did you bring today? You know, like, oh, I bought me orcs. And you get, you, and people will just start, you watch them, they'll start getting out of cases like, oh, that's a really cool conversion. Like, that, ha that just <laughs> yeah. happens. Yeah. And before you know it, two games in, I'm like, how are you getting on with your orcs? I've never met you before. Yeah. But yeah. now we've got that conversation. We've got that common ground. That I, I literally experienced that when we met for the first time in Gibraltar at the No Retreat thing. I knew none of those people. I was just sort of there <laughs> tagging along, um, <laughs> enjoying the experience. Carrying James's luggage. Meeting yeah. everyone. Yeah. Definitely, oh, I didn't even do that. Definitely like, was not no carrying was, my luggage. No I'm way he was getting me to do that. Yeah. Um, I was like, I'll meet you in there. I'm going up to the pool. I'll meet you later. Yeah, yeah. Um, There's no way I'm having anyone carry my luggage. Just, <laughs> I've just got to make that adamantly clear. Like I am more than happy and capable of of carrying my own luggage. All Literally, five foot eight of me. Does so, yeah. a nerve there? Right? Yeah, yeah. 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 Wow. Well, it doesn't doesn't trust that I would uh, drop it or break it. Probably. They'd be slinging it. Um, no one. Place. No <laughs> but one. Anyway, but, threw his catches all over the floor. No oh yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 DC. Um, I still remember. If that. I was handling the catch hands, they wouldn't have been broken. But you left yeah. it to DC. DC. So that's up to you. Um, yeah, I had the same thing. I I'd met obviously some of the people there uh, I'd spoken to via email and we yeah, worked yeah. with, but I had never met any of you. And uh, it was an instant like, oh, I am actually able to connect with these people because we both have a strong interest in this one thing. Yeah, and and it was so easy to chat to everyone. But the, but but if you put that paint, so if we go back to the what we start talking about this, if you put that painting barrier up, there there will be a swathe of people that will be discouraged or or, or just won't want to get involved because there's that there's that kind of perceived barrier and there's a bunch of there's a whole bunch of people there that you might not get to meet who could be amazing people just because this weird fake barrier has been put in place around painting and mm. on a secondary layer to that because of all the social media stuff and all the youtube stuff it's not just a barrier it's like multiple stage barriers of like not just got to paint them they've got to like look good and they've got yeah, to look yeah. better yeah. than everyone else yeah absolutely uh, that, that's a very very good point and i think that if you if there are those multiple barriers it's it's only going to be massively detrimental to what we all want which is the thing that we all love to get wider and further and more well known and and i, I think there's some kind of like resentment for for an industry becoming less niche and more more commercialized like I, i've i mean i've seen this over the last 10 years of siege like you know when i first started the, the, the siege like the industry was nowhere near as commercialized as what it is now with like the types of youtube videos or platforms or, you know, in, when in 2013 2014 there, there was very few channels that were full-time warhammer content producing channels and now we have hundred like there's loads like loads and loads of channels all doing all different forms of content and creation and, and having sustainable full-time full-time working wages and, and and revenue generation off the back of it and it's like the industry whether it's in the realms of painting or whether it's in the realms of 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 just being involved in the hobby it's like it becoming bigger and more well known and more more successful it's like a detriment of some way and it really it really like isn't like well that nerves like, me because i've seen like bad examples of this so for example completely unrelated but it's a similar thing i think uh, i'm really into formula one racing and i have been for years since i was a kid uh, always been into it and in i think 2018 netflix did a big like fire on the wall documentary series called drive to survive and that brought tons of people in it's gone like absolutely through the roof like loads of new fans but there's this like divide of like people the old og fans kind of like look down on the new people they're like oh they're, they're the drive to survive fans they're like they're only in it they're like the new fans because of Netflix and they're not seen as like real fans of it. And it's kind of like yeah. ruined the community and it nerves me a little bit because everyone talks about how they really want all these TV shows and stuff. And I'm like, I really hope you do actually want it. I hope you want other people to have it and you don't just want 
you to have yeah, it. Yeah, the TV shows for me, but not for new people. Yeah. Um, I, I, there's a similar, in the bike world, so I, I own a Harley Davidson, right? And in the bike world, it's, it, that, that can be quite similar in that particular brand as well. Um, so Harley Davidson over the rec- over recent years have made a big change to their motorcycles and the types of bikes they're producing because they need to modernize. Because at the moment, they're typically ridden by 70-year-old fat-bellied men with beards, right? <laughs> I've, I've got part of that already. Um, <laughs> but, but, I love that he's wearing the shirt. But, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but the, but the, not sponsored. So these, new <laughs> ones, these new ones have come out and the old guard are going, they're not real Harleys. Yeah. But what do you think happens to your industry if you don't bring new people in? Yeah, yeah. And I, and I, so I, we could apply this to Warhammer. We could apply this to Formula One. What do you think happens to your industry in general if you don't keep bringing new people into your industry? It dies. It dies. Yeah. Do you yeah. want it to die? That's exactly and, it. And if you are a person who's like, as long as it dies just after I die, I don't care. Then you're quite, you're quite selfish. <laughs> yeah. Quite yeah. Honestly. Yeah. yeah. You know, and I, I think that you know, if we think about 40k in general, if you think about the, the way that the hobby has progressed, if you think about the sculpts that you get, people have been complaining. Okay, people have been complaining about old world sculpts, right? Because they're from 2003. These sculpts are 20 years old and people are complaining about how bad they are compared to new sculpts. We wouldn't have had that level of progression if Games Workshop wasn't as big a business as it is. And it wouldn't be as big a business as it is if it didn't have its customer base. And that only happens because they brought new people in. Yeah. I mean, go and play um, Bolt Action at Warlord. It's a great game. I love it. But the models are terrible. <laughs> they, but they are. They're just comparatively with Games Workshop stuff. I mean, they're not terrible models on, in their own, but compared to Games Workshop models, compared to uh, recent Age of Sigma releases, they are in fact terrible models. You can have that if you want and have a tiny customer base and you don't get new stuff every week. You can have that if that's the world you really want. But I think most people, most people don't actually want that world. They want, it, it's really interesting. They want this big fancy world with all these amazing sculpts and these incredible TV shows, but no new people joining at the same time. It's, it's, you can't it's have a, both. It's yeah. a massive oxymoron. It's just, it's just like, for, for me, it's it, exactly what you're saying about it dying. It's like the, with that mentality, our industry would have been a flash in the pan, been there for a year or two, and then and done. But I think the one thing that I think the one thing that causes a lot of people to that, that maybe potentially do think that way it, is that there's some kind of like <sighs> devolvement of like the, the the demographic in the sense of if because the game is so rich in its lore, its background, its narrative, factions, the IP, all this kind of stuff, and all these all these things. Do you not think that someone new who's getting into it just because they just because they didn't buy a second edition box or weren't weren't around during Rogue Trader or do you, do you not think that they would have the interest if they're that passionate about it to go back and look at all that stuff or find out about all that stuff that, that surely if you you know I, I'm not into comic books but let's just say hypothetically the Marvel thing you said I got into comic books massively I want to know what the first first Iron Man comic is you know I'm going to want to go back and look at that stuff so it's not like it's not like new people coming into the industry are going to be like making it worse because they're not OG or because they're not like, you know. Like, well, it, there's a lot of people yeah. currently who probably want it to be bigger because if you're someone who lives like in a more remote area and you don't have like a local store and you don't have a local scene, like me, for example, my nearest store is like 30 minute drive away, difficult to park. I don't know any of the people there. It's a different town. If the hobby was bigger, I might have a local place. I might, more of my friends might be into it. It might be more accessible for me as someone who's in it. And uh, I've been in the hobby for years. Yeah, I still find it quite inaccessible for myself. I'm just hoping with the deal, Amazon Prime starts stocking it. Yeah. <laughs> Next day delivery, Warhammer. I'm into that. <laughs> That's dangerous. But you have to paint it. <laughs> so, so, yeah. Barriers. Yeah. Yeah. Barriers. No, <laughs> yeah. If you're enjoying the show and you want to get even more painting tips and techniques from us here at Siege, head over to our Patreon. With the Siege Studios Patreon, you'll gain access to a catalogue of over 250 PDF and video tutorials covering a variety of techniques from our foundation tutorials to full character masterclasses and much more. We also have a tier just for you podcast listeners to help support the show. So if you want to take your painters to the next step and make the most of your hobby time, head over to patreon.com forward slash C studios. Yeah, no, um, but I, I, uh, is, that is a very interesting point that's, that I think it's been, is more prevalent now that these things that a lot of people have wanted for, for Warhammer and for the industry and for whatever, like have wanted like films and stuff. I mean, I, I you know, I, I knew for the moment I, I, I saw my first, Space Marine and and read the Angels of Death Codex and that kind of stuff. I mean, like it was eight, eight, in the late eighties, early nineties, whatever. Like I I I had seen Aliens, a film, and I thought, well, this is like Imperial Guard fighting Gene Steelers. I, I can't wait to see this on TV. I've been waiting nearly two decades for it. <laughs> do you know what I mean? So, so I think that people coming into industry is a, there are several barriers, but I think that. If the best way to approach them is to just all the stuff that people do, and like specifically tying back nicely to your channel, that welcoming kind of like just a group of people playing the game, enjoying it, not taking it 
super, super, super seriously and at the same time trying to be that really good way of getting into it, I think if more people approach it in that manner, I think that, that hopefully it will help. It's the best part of the hobby as well is that it you can do this hobby at whatever le level you deem appropriate for yourself. Like if you want to just like buy a couple of models and build them for fun and then never paint them and never play with them, that's okay. If you want to buy the models and paint them and get really into the painting or you want to just get into the gaming or you want to just be into the law, there's so many like ways you can do that. Whereas with other hobbies, like if you want to get into golf, or you've like got to get into golf and like yeah. get all the clubs and learn how to play and go play, do the golf thing. You don't, you know just, what I mean? you don't just ask Barry for <laughs> a you club are... and for a, for a fancy hat and go down and start swinging. Yeah. Yeah. So like, you know, if you want to like... get into golf, you got to do the golf. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's, you know, the, that's the title of the podcast. Yeah, <laughs> that is the sort of genius that you've come to know from this podcast. <laughs> yeah. I think I think what's important though with, with what you just said is you do it at the level that you're comfortable at. This is where I've I've circling right back to the topic that we had you know, for the podcast in general that's what i'm trying to realize now like, i don't need to copy the rich grays of the world to paint my world eaters i don't even need to copy joe who paints for me i mean he does a very i think he does what is achievable standard but he does it so fast that i i've never so i just i need to find that level that i'm happy with with mm. painting and that needs to be my kind of benchmark and then like we said slightly slowly but surely improving on my benchmark yeah. not on someone else's benchmark because if I try, if I pick up a model and try and paint like Martin does now, I'm just not going to do it. Yeah. So I think it's about, I think for me at least, I don't want a painting barrier because I want more people to feel welcome. But when people are painting, I want them to set, or try at least to set realistic expectations for themselves. I think people put a lot of pressure on themselves to look like what you see on Instagram, look like what you see on social media, look like what you see on YouTube. And I think that's been my, one of my biggest struggles over the last two or three years is I've set an, un an unrealistic expectation on myself. Also remembering, of course, that painting's a lot of me muscle memory. Yeah. So I haven't painted a full model in detail. Um, three, three, four years ago, I painted a Farsi on a jet bike and I painted Khan and I did them as single model pieces. I spent loads and loads of time with edging and, and painting stripes on all kinds. And I was so proud of it. I couldn't, that, I painted that and I couldn't do that now because I haven't, I haven't kept up the skill yeah. for the last four years. So I need to, when I pick up that single model, go, I'm not going to replicate what I did four years ago. And I need to make, like, be realistic about what I'm going to achieve now with the brush. That is almost something I wanted to bring up earlier, actually, when you were talking about the striking scorpions, because you were saying, oh, they're rubbish or whatever. And yeah. I was like, well, if that's your first proper thing back and caring about it, then, yeah, it's not going to be as good as what your previous <laughs> yeah, things do, yeah. were. You need to do more of them. And then see where you're at in six think, months or something. I think what's funny for me, genuinely quite amusing at times, I've recently um, bought a guitar. Uh, I'm trying to find other hobbies that keep me occupied because my hobbies are my job. Um, and I bought a guitar because I used to play guitar when I was like 17 years old. You're amongst friends. You're amongst yeah. friends. Yeah. 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 <laughs> and I used to be averagely okay at guitar back at 17. I wasn't great. I didn't play in a band, but I used to very much enjoy in my parents' house putting, putting the amp on and sitting there and playing some of my favorite tracks. And I bought this guitar. What's weird is when I bought this guitar into the house uh, just after Christmas, I didn't expect to be able to pick it up and play it again. I just didn't. I, I've got a, a whole brand new beginner's book, like literally starting from scratch. Because I'm like, I've not played for 20, 20 plus years. There's no way I'm going to be able to play this. But I pick up a model and I haven't painted for, for years. And for some reason, my mind goes, well, you did this five years ago, so you should be able to do it again. Yeah. And I find it's weird that I, like the two different things, I approach them very, very differently. Yeah, but I wonder if it's like I said. I wonder if it's. I genuinely think it's because of social media um, and because of what I'm surrounded by. Um, I'm not surrounded by guitarists who don't. You know, I'm surrounded by people that paint incredible models all the time. On a weird parallel to that, so a background of me, I uh, went to music school. I've got a music degree, guitarist, and I was playing guitar at quite a high level for a long time. And that crossed over into Warhammer. I kind of put all of that aside and started doing the painting. And now I'm at a point where I'm not as proficient on guitar as I used to be, anywhere close. And similarly, like I go back to guitar and I'm not as good as I used to be. Yeah. It's kind of like what you said in the, in the inverse with the, with the painting. Um, if you get what I mean, like I kind of expect to be able to have the muscle memory that I could just play a guitar solo that I used to be able to play when I was 17. Yeah, yeah. I can't anymore. But have it, having that with painting would be, would be strange for me. Yeah, I, I think there's lots of different avenues where muscle memory, it, wane, it peaks and wanes. And I, I, I mean, look, I, we were all here. We all used to play instruments, and all used to be in. in, in and George is still in bands. But Joe used to be in bands. I used to be in bands. Like so, but there's like an element of what remains. But like I, I think with picking a brush up, I think the 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 worry of because it's music is obviously very still very creative and very. There's a lot to it, obviously, still when you're playing an instrument. But I still think that the the, the fear aspect of putting a brush on a model with a bit of paint, I think that's a bit more forgiving than potentially. Like if you hit a bum note or if you 
if you miss notes out in progression or a chord sequence or so i think that has a bit more of an impact rather than i disagree oh, with that i think it's more negligible because if you yeah. make a mistake on stage it's gone yeah but you're not going to get back not... into guitar and then go play wembley are you like no uh, but if <laughs> but even <laughs> but if you're playing if you're playing a song and you're just jamming out in your bedroom if you make a mistake like it's you can just play the song again but with a model it's like I made a mistake on this model and here it is like it's immortalized until yeah, I but, until I go and fix it. It also depends where you make that mistake as well. Yeah. So if you if you painted beautiful white armor or with the scorpions the green the contrast that I used the green did a lot of good work. Then when you go in and do the gold if you slip that gold onto that green you're like how do I Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's shaded and highlighted, but it's not shaded and highlighted because contrast done that. How do I, without, without just painting the whole thing gray sear again and then painting the contrast, like how do I fix that mistake? Exactly. And yeah. if you're playing like a song, so you just re rewind the song, play it again. Yeah, you know what maybe, I, mean? I suppose so. Yeah, but, yeah. James, you're wrong. No, I just, I just think that like, I just think that painting can be a bit more forgiving than, than, than like, because you're trying to follow, follow a very, with the guitar or music, you're following a very linear I that's think, true. You, you play it, you kind of play it like correctly Correct. or you that, don't. That's what I mean. Yeah. yeah, like it's very linear. You've got to hit a certain note at a certain time sequence to make sure that the progression or the song sounds what See, it I would, like I would, it's mad how different everyone's like viewpoints on this can be because I was going to say almost the opposite for the same reason is that you were saying about like on social media, you're seeing all these models, uh, these, these like painted models that are like, that's almost what you're trying to copy. Yep. I'm trying to copy this. Mm -hmm. And yeah. I feel like even when I'm playing guitar, even if I'm playing along to a song, I don't really, I'm not even really paying attention to like how that person played the song. You're not trying you to copy it as much as you are trying to join in. Right. Yeah, so, so, yeah, I'm so, like adding to it. Do you know what I mean? Like yeah. I'm like, yeah, I don't know. It's a weird I, thing I don't to know. explain. I, 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 the reason I say I think it's a bit more forgiving is because like in that vein where if you're looking at an heavy metal paint job and you're like, that's my that's my Homer Simpson barbecue. I'm trying to make it exactly like that. Whereas if you're playing, I don't know, like the if you're flippin', trying, if you're flipping Homer Simpson barbecue, I always use that as a reference. Right. But but like if you're, let's just say you're playing, I don't know, the Van Halen solo out of Beat It from my Michael Jackson. I don't know why I've just randomly thought of that, but still, <laughs> like let's just say you're, you're, you pull that out. Like you wanna you wanna play that solo exactly the same as a solo. It's not like you get halfway through. Like with painting, you can go, I'm painting Ultramarine. So then you use a bit more freedom. With We're in the yeah. weeds now though, yeah. because there's a lot of people that like to do their own interpretations of things and a lot of things are more improvisational. Yeah, with, maybe. Yeah. I don't know. But like my- May I introduce you to jazz? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. My thought process is, is like, it's like, if, if I want to learn that solo and I'm trying to play that song, I'll try and play in it as linear as that because that's what I'm trying to learn or play. Does that make sense? Whereas yeah. if I paint an Ultramarine, and let's just say hypothetically, you spill some, you're painting the, the grill on the marine or whatever, and you slip onto the Aquila, you, you go, well, actually, I'll just paint the Aquila silver. It's not like you get halfway through the Van Halen solo and then there's a dive or there's like a something and you're like, oh, I'll just stick like a harmonic in there. Or, do you know what I mean? Yeah, it's but not I'd argue that you kind of do have that as well because like, as uh, box art style painters like me and yourself, like our Van Halen solo is the heavy metal marine that we're trying to copy one for one. Yeah, I know. But for someone getting in, like, getting back into painting or for someone doing something new, I just, I just personally feel there's a bit more freedom where if you make a little mistake, you can still paint an ultramarine, but it, it just has a slight difference. It's not like a sequence of notes where they have to be exact. Comments are going to have a feel. Yeah, I know. Yeah. I, don't know. <laughs> I was about to say, sorry, listeners, I wish I'd never mentioned guitars. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you didn't know what you were yeah, yeah. up there. So we're starting a music podcast soon. Yeah, like, um, yeah no, but, um, but yeah, that's my thought. But in, in summary, like with painting for yourself, like, so obviously we spoke about what got you, got you back into doing those, those striking scorpions. Um, and obviously that that sort of gauntlet that Joe put down yeah. for you essentially, maybe maybe a good avenue for you. And I, I, I want to table this. Maybe a good avenue is rather than the the, the the exact thing you described where you like want to paint one, you get really into it. You do the stages X amount of models, and then there's that one that suddenly starts leading the race, if so to speak. Yeah. Like maybe just doing like the odd character and stuff for, for yourself is because it gives you that singular singular thing for completion that you can do that, and you haven't got to go through the batch process, but you're still having that 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 way so of doing it. I want, I, I, this, is really, this is a really weird thing to say. I, I want a fully painted army that's mine. Yeah. Um, because if I go to events, tournaments, anything like that now, anything I take with me, I haven't painted. And there's something about whether, so if I have a fully painted army that's mine now, it's going to be probably worse than most of what's in the studio. Uh, and I accept that. Joe's a better painter than me. My siege armies are better than I can do at the moment, at least anyway. So that's just going to be the case, right? So when when a person walks up to me on the table and goes, "That's incredible," I'm like, "Yeah, Joe painted it. That's that Magnus is amazing. Yeah, it's Siege. Like I, I don't have, I, I never get that that 
and what I found was incredible gratification of, yeah, yeah I did that. Yeah. Like, I'm really proud of it. Yeah, yeah. And and some of the previous armies that I had that I painted weren't up to the same standard, but for some reason I felt prouder of them because mm -hmm. they were literally my work. So I do want to get to a point where I have uh, an army painted that's mine. I'm currently working on two for 40k, which is interesting. This is another thing I've done, which is different. I, we have a, a World Eaters army and a Dark Angels army for the channel painted mm -hmm. already. And the two armies I'm working at home are World Eaters and Dark Angels. And Joe said to me, what are you doing that for? I was like, because well, if I don't paint these two, I'm, I'm literally painting something simply because it's something we don't already have. Mm. That adds an additional pressure to it because we, we could then do with it for the channel. Uh, but also it's, it means it's not something I'm super invested in. So I'm painting something for the sake of it. Um, so I, I'm now, I've now gone on the route of picking these two factions because they are the two armies that I'm particularly invested in. I'm leaving Aldor alone for 10th edition because rules-wise they're wildly busted. Um, but what I've been looking at doing recently, and I've, I've spent some time on the GW website actually um, not too long ago, is I'm going to try, I think, and literally pick random individual models for factions because we spoke about this, and yeah, I, yeah. I got me thinking. For things that I've ne I would ne I don't want to make a full army. I don't want to paint a full army at all. But I want to. I want to have a go at that one model. Yeah. And I feel like I, that I've got this little thing in the back of my mind. Time poor isn't going to help this. But I would one day love to just enter a painting competition yeah. with the confidence that I'm still really proud of that. I don't think I'm going to win, but I'm really proud of that, and I'm happy to put that in a cabinet in front of people. And I want to get there. And I feel like picking individual models and having a go on them is the the probably more likely successful path to getting there yeah. than army painting. Um, and I'm hoping that perhaps it also means that. I'm really bored of doing Berserker trim. You know what I can do? I can work on Croak yeah. for a bit because that's the model I've got that, yeah. you know, and it, it comes away from that, mono that monotonous doing brass constantly. Um, because I also think the monotony sometimes for me of army painting is part of what kills my motivation as well, actually. And so we talked about that already, right? When you've done the 10 and, the, and that one horse leaves that race and then you go, I've done him, I've got to do nine more. If I have nothing that I can pivot away to, it's a different color palette, a different style, yeah. whatever, I'm almost never going to find the 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 passion to pick that project back up and carry on. Yeah. And be, I feel like I'm kind of in the groove. Yeah, yeah. And that groove is then gone. But if I have something that I can I can pick up that's a completely different color palette, a completely different style, a completely different way of painting, it's possible that I can go, oh cool, it felt good. I'll go back to doing these lenses now. I'm quite happy to do them. So so well one thing that I always say about that and that's to help with that. And I think that that's something that that might potentially help you is we we touched upon various these things. And I do want to dial back to competition painting as well briefly as well. But um I think the, the exact thing that you're doing is, is the way of doing it. But what you need to, with the mindset of approaching it, I would definitely say that what you should see that croak, that thing as, is the reward for doing this. Like do X amount of things on this, stages on this. And then I, I know people that set a timer and have like a 30 minute timer countdown. I'm allowed 30 minutes of fun time <laughs> on this thing that isn't the slog. Yeah. You know, and that, and that uh, uh, even at a base, uh, like a real, a real sort of low, low level even as a child like you, know, you like when you get like chores around the house or if you go and wash up or go put the bins out or do this or whatever you'll get this much pocket money you need that re that that reward for that effort or that hard work or the thing that you do so maybe continue what you're doing but then but then visualize by basically going right well i'm allowed i've done three stages of blocking or i've painted all the trim berserkers or whatever the case may be and then i'm going to spend half an hour just just doing the, the satchel on the back of this model it's you a, know like i used to so i used to do i someone encouraged me to do something very similar recently not too long ago um but the problem what they suggested didn't work and I, i'll explain so it was a very similar process but like you paint your 10 berserkers but then your reward is you get to paint a character yeah. right but of the same army yeah so i'm like well the, but it's the same. Yeah. I'm still painting the same red, the same brass trim. The same. It's got more stuff on it. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Just hard reward. Yeah. Right. So, but what I found, the reason why I found that was a struggle because I felt like, well, I might as well batch paint this thing with these and it becomes the same process. So it doesn't feel like a break. Yeah. At least. So I feel like if I, if I do, if I do whatever I need to do on 10 berserkers, whatever the, the limit I might say is, and I go away and paint a croak or, or whatever it might be, something completely different or, or the lion or I don't know, a whole different color palette that then will feel like a break from the monotony. And I yeah. feel like that's probably more that is kind of successful. The, the good thing about you doing two armies, though, is you can do that and still get both armies done because you can paint 10 from one thing. Well, reward yourself with a character from the other one, which is completely different. Yeah, then I you're still contributing to an army. So, so World Eaters is a, a kind of mono color, whichever color you choose, obviously. But the bonus with Dark Angels, at least, is you have Ravenwing, Deathwing, Greenwing. Yeah. Um, so 
So between the, the two factions, I've got green armor, bone armor, black armor, red Loads armor. Loads of variety to go through. So, and it's space marines that I've found in the historic are typically quite rewarding to paint anyway. They're quite forgiving. Yeah. And you can make them look quite impactful quite quickly. And because of the way the edging works on space marines, you know, for someone who doesn't have brush control at the moment, you can still get relatively neat kind of highlights and lines, which you normally wouldn't be able to achieve on a model that's more kind of free-flowing. Um, so I'm hoping, my thought process is, that by doing those two factions with all those different armor options, something new and different is possible. And even if I go from painting 10 Berserkers to a single Deathwing Terminator, it's enough of a palette change and a model style change that it's going to feel refreshing. Mm. I'm not doing a big fancy character, but it is doing an individual model. And I can go back to my 10 Berserkers. Yeah, yeah no, definitely. Yeah. That's, That's why you've got a good plan in place. The plan's there. Two armies fully done in no time, yeah. I think. Yeah. Have you set yourself like a deadline or time frame? No, I don't think... I think I don't like dead. I like. I do like deadlines. I don't like deadlines of painting. <laughs> uh, it's really weird to say that. But Just like, added pressure, isn't it? Yeah. If, unless I, it's an, a I've need. worked to deadlines for a long time. What, you, I, need, what you need is Joe to turn around to you and say, "You're not going to get that army done by." Yeah. And then, and then <laughs> next uh, week, next week, you'll be like, <laughs> "But saying that, James, the scorpions stress me out." Yeah. <laughs> because but you got it done. Yeah, and they were done. And it, I'm very grateful that GW pushed the NDA date back by like three weeks. Yeah. That helped. Yeah. <laughs> when I finished them like the Friday before the NDA was lifted. But if you're enjoying this episode of Paint Perspective, I just wanted to ask that you do us a huge favor by leaving a rating and review on whatever platform you're using, and also choosing to follow and subscribe. It really helps us out and it helps us deliver these episodes to you for free every week. Now back to the show. Question of the week time. Thank you everyone for submitting your questions for question of the week. If you have a question that you would like us to answer on the show, please leave it in the comments down below on YouTube. Uh, this week we have a question from Geek English once again, who says, if there was another franchise you could pick to get the same treatment from Games Workshop, what would it be? Witcher or Doctor Who for me? Mm, that's a tough one. Do you mean the level of investment in the sense of miniature production? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, that is real hard. That Funny enough for me, hard. it's actually one that GW does, which is Lord of the Rings. Well, you just want it revitalized. Again? Yeah. 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 Well, I mean, to be fair with Lord of the Rings, so I'm a huge Lord of the Rings fan. The models aren't the same standard as for you. Like, they could put a ton of time and effort into that. That would be interesting. Yeah. And as well, like, Obviously, like 40k gets like, releases like every week, and I know like you're limited by the source material to a degree. Yeah. But like, how often is it we get Middle Earth stuff? It's not, it's not very often, and a lot of the stuff's really dated now. Yeah. Um, yeah especially I, like some of the old fine cast stuff, and you know. Yeah, I I don't know. There's there's quite a few. I don't know whether to go down the route of actually something that's got lots of depth, which is something off the wall that's pretty funny. But I've got two. Mm, go on. So I'd like I'd like to see a tabletop version of Worms again. Yes. <laughs> like. <laughs> You there, kind of no, not. There is no way I would have guessed that. In a yeah. I did not like, think that's I, where that was going. Because like, like, I, I think you could have some. Like you, I've seen some of the recent kill, like not kill team, like the um, uh, the the what's what's the skirmish? game? The skirmish game. You absolutely love what it's called now. Underworld. Underworld. Yeah, underworld. There's some amazing underworld teams that've got loads of little critters and animals and stuff in it. But like, can you imagine and that new that new Blood Bowl team? Yeah, has and, like loads of little creatures. Yeah, on it, as well. it has. So can you imagine like having like a kill team version of worms that'd be amazing and you can like kit out all your work individual that worms. is mental like, am i the only one that's just absolutely <laughs> I, thought that'd be, I thought that'd be amazing like, that'd be absolutely brilliant <laughs> but you have to enjoy painting pink skin though obviously because like the worms obviously that color but like um but yeah i just think those models would be that'd be amazing what a curveball so, wasn't expecting that uh, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> so there's there's that there's star that. wars no um blade runner no uh worms yeah i think that would be amazing um personally uh, but the other the other thing i was thinking is like you could it's again it's another science fiction ip but like i don't think there's ever been anything there's been a lot of computer games for it but there's i don't know of anything uh, I, micro machines as toys brought out like versions of the ships and stuff but like i think doing some kind of like uh, like star trek away team kind of like themed game whereby you have like it's almost like a RPG where you, you have an away team, you select your characters, you make like a kill team or like an away team or whatever, and you can have like the space aspect of it. And like, I think that could be quite cool where you could have some really amazing... But what about, what about one where you'd want like full like 40K level? Like, that's not yeah, yeah, like yeah. huge... Well, you could do that in Star Trek because you've got Klingons, you've got the Romanins, you've got Borg, True, yeah. you've, got, you've got Federation, you've got the Ferengi, you've got like, you've got loads of, loads of things. I think Star Trek, like... Star Star Wars and there's always this thing of like Star Wars, Star Trek, which camp do you like like laying or whatever, blah, blah. But like I just think that it, it's got a really interesting um 
backstory to it and like the whole thing about humanity and like money not existing and like all that kind of, I think it's just a real interesting kind of like interesting story setting but like for a game perspective because I, I play a lot of board games um and I, like boxy got me massively into like uh zombie side and stuff like that and my friend tom who's a friend of the business like he he plays a lot of mansions of madness so i don't know if you if you've heard of that game or not oh, but yeah it, i know all but it. but it's like it's like a murder mystery kind of like uh dystopian kind of like game and, and it's a really cool cool board game but i think like a, a star trek kind of like tabletop with like an away team uh kind of like aspect where like random things happen it's like an rpg but you can you also have like a kill team aspect of it and you can play the people that the kill team are fighting against or the you know miniature wise what would you what would you want from that oh, i would cling, cling on kill team all day long yeah <laughs> Cling, cling, on, on kill cling on kill team all day long or away team whatever yeah they're amazing and they have to do a character of the actor that played the doc in back to the future because he played the cling on in, in one of the star what, trek christopher films. lloyd yeah he played one of the he played a cling on in one of the stuff he, he should have done that for his uh his movie idea yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. He, he he so the guy who plays i can't remember, i always forget the actor's name uh but the guy who plays doc in back to the future well, just uh, that christopher lloyd yeah christopher yeah. lloyd yeah I, I forgot his name that that short brief moment of time but christopher lloyd He's actually quite pivotal because he kills he kills Kirk's son in Star Trek, so he's quite a quite an integral character. But yeah, I can just imagine a really cool miniature. That's that's a mad like pub quiz knowledge little nugget. That yeah, I, I, just, I did I, not know I that. Do like Star Trek? If there's two phrases I never thought I'd ever hear, whilst or two things I never thought I'd ever hear, what's on this podcast is that you wanted a Worms board game. That'd be amazing. And a Klingon kill team. Yeah, that'd be amazing. <laughs> he said those in such rapid succession. I know. Yeah. Well. yeah. I've been thinking about this for months. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I just, I just think it would be an amazing game. If like you're saying the same level of treatment as in the quality of miniatures, the quality <laughs> just of, a really, really detailed worm. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> the massive would bazooka. Like, like, yeah, like, like. Would they be like? Uh, Please do a kit bash with the Desolation Squad. Oh my god, can you imagine how good that would be? Like, would they be like epic scale? Would they be, like the worms? Because well, when you're playing the game, it's like they're tiny, aren't they? The worms. Well, I guess we're doing a pretty big table. I think we're going to yeah, do 32 mil scale. Yeah, you could do. Yeah, yeah. Go home. 30, 32 mil. And but it's got to be do. destructible because it worms. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So you yeah. got to have just polystyrene terrain that you just <laughs> smash. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I didn't know. Just punch a hole out of it every time. <laughs> <laughs> you got to buy a whole new board every single game you want to play. <laughs> I didn't know that. Like, the, 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 I mean, the person obviously that asked the question wanted an honest answer, and that's my thing. But like, I don't know. Like, is there anything that you would want a board game made of? Like then. Not in that variety. I mean, I said I wanted, they said in terms of GW, like giving them the same sort of treatment. So I said the Lord of the Rings because I wanted more miniatures, but you just went completely on. I mean, I, I think that's just quite a safe yeah. bet, George, to be honest. Like yeah. This, you know, like I wanted, it safe? I wanted to be. In fair, like everyone's going to listen to this. Like, yeah, I was thinking worms. Yeah. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. So glad you vocalized that. Yeah. I think, I think Voice for, of the people. for model treatment, if I was going to play safe, like George, for model treatment, you know, but I love bolt action as a gaming system, but it could do with a GW level of model treatment. If I'm a huge World War One and Two nut, I love it. Um, I think having 32 mil scaled, created in Games Workshops, you know, science labs where they make the incredible model they make would be amazing. Yeah, so Probably. having GW do an actual historic. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So if I was going to go random, if I was going to take James's path, I would actually love to see like a Gork and Morka style Sons of Anarchy game. Oh, that'd be great. It'd be amazing. Yeah, that'd be amazing. <laughs> yeah, yeah that, that, that'd be really good. That'd be actually. amazing. Um, yeah, all, all, all that again, like very similar to that. Like, imagine if they Gorka Morka, like the way I look at it is it's like sci fi Mad Max. Yeah. So, like, imagine if you've done like a Mad Max, oh, like, Mad Max style tabletop game, because it's literally like you could be you against anyone. You could have a game where it involves like, I don't know how it'd work for turns. I'm not going to get into game development because I can't do that for Toffee. But, <laughs> but like, can you imagine like having like 80 mates around and you've all got like cars with like machine guns strapped to them and stuff Gorka like Morka, that? Man, like, it was yeah, great. It, it, it was, yeah, yeah. But like, <laughs> Yeah, that's kind of like, that'd be quite a cool. So my, I just have a quick one. Go on. I would want them to do a wrestling game. Oh my God, that'd be amazing. So I would want them to get like the WWE license in and do all your classic stuff. You can paint your own little miniature Dwayne The Rock Johnson. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You'd have to get like a little sound. I know there's a, there's a game, there is a wrestling, like fantasy wrestling game. Uh, I can't remember I can't what it's Another one you mean, but yeah, I can't um, remember but like actually having the licenses of doing that and being able to paint a little like stone cold and stuff. Well, can you imagine painting Ric Flair mid woo? Yeah. Like, yeah. Can you imagine yeah, how yeah. amazing that would be? Like, that would yeah. be, like, be incredible. Yeah. I, I don't that. know how many men in pants I'd want to paint though. Uh, I wouldn't have a problem I'll with it. I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't have a problem with it myself. I'd no. be fine. Fair. Um, yeah. But yeah. I, th I, I just think there's loads of, like, this is the thing I love about, uh, in a bit of a segue and touching back on one of the things you said, I think one of the real, virtues of all the stuff that is looming on the horizon with with 
with Games Workshop and obviously like Amazon and stuff like that, is that if it doesn't, if if whatever people think about new people coming into the hobby or whatever, blah, blah. But one thing I, I think that it will have a massive impact on is actually just making tabletop gaming and painting miniatures and doing that stuff. I think it will just broadcast it to a much further demographic, which yeah. will ultimately lead, hopefully, in lots of other things happening within that in that, in that niche. And like these crazy things we're talking about, which, you know, a worms tabletop war game would be insane. But like stuff like that, like it just, it just gives the opportunity for other things to, to, to have birth, which I think is really, really important for, for everybody in the industry. Um, but yeah, worms. <laughs> I got to do that's it. the winner. Yeah, that's, that's the, the winner. winner. Okay, just to round out the show, we have our closing segment, which is called Hobby Hacks. We share a little hobby hack with you that you can hopefully implement uh, into your painting sessions. Liam, have you got a little hobby hack I, for yeah, us? So James asked me this yesterday when I turned up and I was like, I, I haven't got a clue. And I've been thinking about this and this actually came up. I was doing, I've been doing some Twitch hobby streams not, uh, over the course of January, uh, February. I did something and I can't believe the amount of people that didn't know this was a thing. So I, I just suggested it. And he was like, oh, it's a good hack. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, you get the, the, the metal sticks in your, on your glue, like Revel, the Revel glue typically has these. I yeah, think, Citadel you know, does as well, I think. Do they still? Oh, yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. So used to, yeah. Often yeah. the glue dries in that tube, and then you'll squeeze, and a bit if like you'll have a shoot the metal tube across the room, or <laughs> it, it, it causes. Anyway, I learned this from someone a long, long time ago. If you take a lighter and you just literally run that lighter briefly over the end of that that metal stick, you'll probably hear a fizz and a pop. At which point you've cleared the tube. It's that simple. And I I cannot believe how many glues I've probably thrown away because they're blocked up. But if I just lit lit the end with a nice lighter. Freed it all up, loosened it all up, squeezed the tube, out it comes. I've got a Citadel glue in my drawer right now where the needle applicator is clogged. And it's, I've just been like, oh, I'll deal with just, that later. <laughs> <laughs> just yeah. to clarify, if you're using a glue and the nozzle is plastic, do not <laughs> do, <laughs> do not do that. Yeah. Yeah. No, that, that's brilliant. Yeah, I mean, I said, I, I've those Revel things are notorious for like clogging them. And I, I literally, I've always struggled to get that out. So that's really helpful. Frustratingly, because they're such great applicators oh, yeah, when they're, they're not clogged. But... Yeah, they are I, I spent the longest time jamming because loose does a lot of sewing and stuff literally trying to jam needles down the end to try and clear it oh, out oh my airbrush needles yeah, yeah. they're great yeah, I, I, yeah. I, I, I spent ages trying to do that and then i was sat in there's a place called fat tom you've been there and i sat there one day and cad who's the owner got a little light and, went, Psh, and i was like we don't know uh, glue was clogged and off he went gluing it i was like you are joking <laughs> the amount of holes in my thumbs from jamming needles <laughs> in the end. yeah uh, before i learned the airbrush needle trick for the end i literally struggled finding anything that was like small enough to yeah even down. even with the airbrush though you can't like get the whole way down there obviously so the light lighter is actually a great idea. it's great yeah. it yeah. works yeah. Yeah. just yeah. please be careful not to burn yourself yeah, yeah. <laughs> or, or, or end up with a flat a flaming torch glue applicator <laughs> held the lighter on for too long and it's caught fire yeah yeah, okay. yeah no, right. that's brilliant cool sweet well thank you everyone for listening to this week's episode of paint perspective liam have you got uh we'll have all of your links uh, in the description below obviously but do you want to for audio listeners do you want to just tell everyone where to head over to to find your channel yeah it's just my name so if you search liam dempsey on uh, on youtube it should come up because i don't think there's many of us um or you can uh, i think it's like youtube.com slash c slash at liam dempsey 40k i think do you have like a set time day you do streams that sort of thing i do but it's probably about to change so <laughs> we'll, we we stream um uh, Tuesdays to Fridays, we're about to add Mondays in, so we stream every single weekday, typically in the evening. Um, the schedule's about to change to basically 7.30 every evening, as well as Thursday lunchtime and Friday a little bit later as well. Cool. Awesome. Um, yeah, Wonderful. Busy, busy, busy. Well, thank you once again for coming on the show. You're and, amazing. Uh, thank you for having me. No, you're welcome. Thank you everyone for listening to this week's episode of Paint Perspective. Check out all the links in the description below, and we will catch you next week. Bye.